Part Four, Chapter Three of A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Chapter Three Martyrdom. At the time when the Methodist and Presbyterian churches passed the anti slavery resolutions which we have recorded, the system of slavery could probably have been extirpated by the church with comparatively little trouble. Such was the experience of the Quakers, who tried the experiment at that time, and succeeded. The course they pursued was the simplest possible. They districted their church and appointed regular committees, whose business it was to go from house to house, and urge the rules of the church individually on each slaveholder one by one. This was done in a spirit of such simplicity and brotherly love that very few resisted the appeal. They quietly yielded up in obedience to their own consciences and the influence of their brethren. This mode of operation, though gentle, was as efficient as the calm sun of summer, which by a few hours of patient shining dissolves the iceberg on which all the storms of winter have beat in vain. Oh, that so happy a course had been thought of and pursued by all the other denominations. But the day is past when this monstrous evil would so quietly yield to gentle and persuasive measures. At the time that the Quakers made their attempt, this Leviathan in the reeds and rushes of America was young and callow, and had not learned his strength. Then he might have been drawn out with a hook. Then they might have made a covenant with him, and taken him for a servant for ever. But now Leviathan is full grown. Behold, the hope of him is vain. Shall not men be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. His scales are his pride, shut up together as with a close seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. They are firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone yea, as hard as the nether millstone. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold. He esteemeth iron as straw, and brass as rotten wood. Arrows cannot make him flee. Slingstones are turned with him into stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Upon the earth there is not his life. He is king over all the children of pride. There are those who yet retain the delusion that somehow or other without any very particular effort or opposition, by a soft, genteel, rather apologetic style of operation, Leviathan is to be converted, baptized, and Christianized. They can try it. Such a style answers admirably as long as it is understood to mean nothing. But just the moment that Leviathan finds they are in earnest, then they will see the consequences. The debates of all the synods in the United States as to whether he is an evil per se will not wake him. In fact, they are rather a pleasant humdrum. Nor will any resolutions that they behold him with regret give him a special concern. Neither will he be much annoyed by the expressed expectation that he is to die somewhere about the millennium. Notwithstanding all the recommendations of synods and conferences, Leviathan himself is but an indifferent opinion of his own Christianity and an impression that he would not be considered quite in keeping with the universal reign of Christ on earth. But he doesn't much concern himself about the prospect of giving up the ghost at so very remote a period. But let any one, either north or south, take the sword of the spirit and make one pass under his scales that he shall feel, and then he will know what sort of conflict Christian had with Apollyon. Let no one, neither north or south, undertake this warfare to whom fame or ease or wealth or anything that this world has to give are too dear to be sacrificed. Let no one undertake it who is not prepared to hate his own good name, and, if need be, his life also. For this reason we will give here the example of one martyr who died for this cause. For it has been well said that the blood of the martyr is the seed of the church." The Reverend Elijah P. Lovejoy was the son of a Maine woman, a native of that state which, barren in all things else, is fruitful in noble sentiments and heroic deeds. Of his early days we say nothing. Probably they were like those of other Maine boys. 
we take up his history where we find him a clergyman in st louis missouri editing a religious newspaper though professing not to be a technical abolitionist he took an open and decided stand against slavery this aroused great indignation and called forth threats of violence soon after a mob composed of the most respectable individuals of the place burned alive a negro man in the streets of st louis for stabbing the officers who came to arrest him this scene of protracted torture lasted till the deed was completed and the shrieks of the victim for a more merciful death were disregarded in his charge to the grand jury judge lawless decided that no legal redress could be had for this outrage because being the act of an infuriated multitude it was above the law elijah lovejoy expressed in determined language his horror of the transaction and of the decision for these causes his office was torn down and destroyed by the mob happening to be in st charles a mob of such men as only slavery could raise attacked the house to take his life his distracted wife kept guard at his door struggling with men armed with bludgeons and bowie knives who swore that they would have his heart's blood a woman's last despair and the aid of friends repelled the first assault but when the mob again returned he made his escape lovejoy came to alton illinois and there set up his paper the mob followed him his press was twice destroyed and he was daily threatened with assassination before his press was destroyed the third time a call was issued in his paper for a convention of the enemies of slavery and friends of free inquiry in illinois for the purpose of considering and recommending measures adapted to meet the existing crisis this call was signed by about two hundred and fifty persons from different parts of the state among them was the rev e beecher then president of illinois college this gathering brought together a large number when they met for discussion the mobocrats came also among them and there was a great ferment the mob finally outvoted and dissolved the convention it was then resolved to form an anti-slavery society and to issue a declaration of sentiments and an address to the people of the state threats were expressed that if mr lovejoy continued to print his paper the mob would destroy his expected press in this state of excitement mr beecher at the request of the society preached two sermons setting forth the views and course of conduct which were contemplated in the proposed movement they were subsequently set forth in a published document an extract from which will give the reader an idea of what they were one we shall endeavor to induce all our fellow citizens to elevate their minds above all selfish pecuniary political and local interests and from a deep sense of the presence of god to regard solely the eternal and immutable principles of truth which no human legislature or popular sentiment can alter or remove two we shall endeavor to present the question as one between this community and god a subject on which he deeply feels and on which we owe great and important duties to him and to our fellow citizens three we shall endeavor as far as possible to allay the violence of party strife to remove all unholy excitement and to produce mutual confidence and kindness and a deep interest in the welfare of all parts of our nation and a strong desire to preserve its union and promote its highest welfare our entire reliance is upon truth and love and the influence of the holy spirit we desire to compel no one to act against his judgment or conscience by an oppressive power of public sentiment but to arouse all men to candid thought and impartial inquiry in the fear of god we do desire and to accomplish this end we shall use the same means that are used to enlighten and elevate the public mind on all other great moral subjects personal influence public address the pulpit and the press four we shall endeavor to produce a new and radical investigation of the principles of human rights and of the relations of all just legislation to them deriving our principles from the nature of the human mind the relations of man to god and the revealed will of the creator five we shall then endeavor to examine the slave laws of our land in the light of these principles and to prove that they are essentially sinful and that they are at war alike with the will of god and all the interests of the master the slave and the community at large six 
we shall endeavor to show in what manner communities where such laws exist may relieve themselves at once in perfect safety and peace both of the guilt and dangers of the system seven and until communities can be aroused to do their duties we shall endeavor to illustrate and enforce the duties of individual slaveholders in such communities to views presented in this spirit and manner one would think there could have been no rational objection the only difficulty with them was that though calm and kind they were felt to be in earnest and at once leviathan was wide awake the next practical question was shall the third printing press be defended or shall it be destroyed there was a tremendous excitement and a great popular tumult the timid prudent peace-loving majority who are to be found in every city who care not what principles prevail so they promote their own interest were wavering and pusillanimous and thus encouraged the mob every motive was urged to induce mr beecher and mr lovejoy to forego the attempt to re-establish the press the former was told that a price had been set on his head in missouri a fashionable mode of meeting argument in the pro-slavery parts of this country mr lovejoy had been so long threatened with assassination day and night that the argument with him was something musty mr beecher was also told that the interests of the college of which he was president would be sacrificed and that if he chose to risk his own safety he had no right to risk those interests but mr beecher and mr lovejoy both felt that the very foundation principle of free institutions had at this time been seriously compromised all over the country by yielding up the right of free discussion to the clamors of the mob that it was a precedent of very wide and very dangerous application in a public meeting mr beecher addressed the citizens on the right of maintaining free inquiry and of supporting every man in the right of publishing and speaking his conscientious opinions he read to them some of those eloquent passages on which dr channing had maintained the same rights in very similar circumstances in boston he read to them extracts from foreign papers which showed how the American character suffered in foreign lands from the prevalence in America of lynch law and mob violence. He defended the right of Mr. Lovejoy to print and publish his conscientious opinions. And finally, he read from some Southern journals extracts in which they had strongly condemned the course of the mob and vindicated Mr. Lovejoy's right to express his opinions. He then proposed to them that they should pass resolutions to the following effect that the free communication of opinion is one of the invaluable rights of man and that every citizen may freely speak write or print on any subject being responsible for the abuse of the liberty that maintenance of these principles should be independent of all regard to persons and sentiments that they should be especially maintained with regard to unpopular sentiments since no others need the protection of law that on these grounds alone and without regard to political or moral differences we agree to protect the press and property of the editor of the alton observer and support him in his right to publish whatever he pleases holding him responsible only to the laws of the land these resolutions so proposed were to be taken into consideration at a final meeting of the citizens which was to be held the next day that meeting was held their first step was to deprive mr beecher and all who were not citizens of that county of the right of debating on the report to be presented the committee then reported that they deeply regretted the excited state of feeling that they cherished strong confidence that the citizens would refrain from undue excitements that the exigences of the time required a course of moderation and compromise and that while there was no disposition to prevent free discussion in general they deemed it indispensable to the public tranquillity that mr lovejoy should not publish a paper in that city not wishing to reflect in the slightest degree upon mr lovejoy's character and motives all that the meeting waited for now was to hear whether mr lovejoy would comply with their recommendation one of the committee arose and expressed his sympathy for mr lovejoy characterizing him as an unfortunate individual hoping that they would all consider that he had a wife and family to support and trusting that they would disgrace him as little as possible but that he and all his party would see the necessity of making a compromise and departing from alton what followed is related in the words of mr beecher who was present at the meeting as brother lovejoy rose to reply to the speech above mentioned 
i watched his countenance with deep interest not to say anxiety i saw no tokens of disturbance with a tranquil self-possessed air he went up to the bar within which the chairman sat and in a tone of deep tender and subdued feeling spoke as follows i feel mr chairman that this is the most solemn moment of my life i feel i trust in some measure the responsibilities which at this hour i sustain to these my fellow citizens to the church of which i am a minister to my country and to god and let me beg of you before i proceed further to construe nothing i shall say as being disrespectful to this assembly i have no such feeling far from it and if i do not act or speak according to their wishes at all times it is because i cannot conscientiously do it it is proper i should state the whole matter as i understand it before this audience i do not stand here to argue the question as presented by the report of the committee my only wonder is that the honorable gentleman the chairman of that committee for whose character i entertain great respect though i have not the pleasure of his personal acquaintance my only wonder is how that gentleman could have brought himself to submit such a report mr chairman i do not admit that it is the business of this assembly to decide whether i shall or shall not publish a newspaper in this city the gentlemen have as the lawyers say made a wrong issue i have the right to do it i know that i have the right freely to speak and publish my sentiments subject only to the laws of the land for the abase of that right this right was given me by my maker and is solemnly guaranteed to me by the constitution of these united states and of this state what i wish to know of you is whether you will protect me in the exercise of this right or whether as heretofore i am to be subjected to personal indignity and outrage these resolutions and the measures proposed by them are spoken of as a compromise a compromise between two parties mr chairman this is not so there is but one party here it is simply a question whether the law shall be enforced or whether the mob shall be allowed as they now do to continue to trample it under their feet by violating with impunity the rights of an innocent individual mr chairman what have i to compromise if freely to forgive those who have so greatly injured me if to pray for their temporal and eternal happiness is still to wish for the prosperity of your city and state notwithstanding all the indignities i have suffered in it if this be the compromise intended then do i willingly make it my rights have been shamefully wickedly outraged this i know and feel and can never forget but i can and do freely forgive those who have done it but if by a compromise is met that i should cease from doing that which duty requires of me i cannot make it the reason is that i fear god more than i fear man think not that i would lightly go contrary to public sentiment around me the good opinion of my fellow men is dear to me and i would sacrifice anything but principle to obtain their good wishes and when they ask me to surrender this they ask for more than i can than i dare give the reference is made to the fact that i offered a few days since to give up the editorship of the observer into other hands this is true i did so because it was thought or said by some that perhaps the paper would be better patronized in other hands they declined accepting my offer however and since then we have heard from the friends and supporters of the paper in all parts of the state there was but one sentiment among them and this was that the paper could be sustained in no other hands than mine it is also a very different question whether i shall voluntarily or at the request of friends yield up my post or whether i shall forsake it at the demand of a mob the former i am at all times ready to do when circumstances occur to require it as i will never put my personal wishes or interests in competition with the cause of that master whose minister i am but the latter be assured i never will do god in his providence so say all my brethren and so i think has devolved upon me the responsibility of maintaining my ground here and mr chairman i am determined to do it a voice comes to me from maine from massachusetts from connecticut from new york from pennsylvania yea from kentucky from mississippi from missouri calling upon me in the name of all that is dear in heaven or earth to stand fast and by the help of god i will stand 
I know I am but one, and you are many. My strength would avail but little against you all. You can crush me, if you will, but I shall die at my post, for I cannot and will not forsake it. Why should I flee from Alton? Is this not a free state? When assailed by a mob at St. Louis, I came hither, as to the home of freedom and to the laws. The mob has pursued me here, and why should I retreat again? Where can I be safe if not here? Have not I a right to claim the protection of the laws? What more can I have in any other place? Sir, the very act of retreating will embolden the mob to follow me wherever I go. No, sir, there is no way to escape the mob and to abandon the path of duty, and that, God helping me, I will never do. It has been said here that my hand is against every man, and every man's hand against me. The last part of the declaration is too painfully true. I do indeed find almost every hand lifted against me. But against whom in this place has my hand been raised? I appeal to every individual present. Whom of you have I injured? Whose character have I traduced? Whose family have I molested? Whose business have I meddled with? If any, let him rise here and testify against me. No one answers. And do not your resolution say that you find nothing against my private or personal character? And does any one believe that if there was anything to be found, it would not be found and brought forth? If in anything I have offended against the law, I am not so popular in this community as that it would be difficult to convict me. You have courts and judges and juries. They find nothing against me. And now you come together for the purpose of driving out a confessedly innocent man, for no cause but that he dares to think and speak as his conscience and his God dictate. Will conduct like this stand the scrutiny of your country, of posterity, above all of the judgment day? For remember, the judge of that day is no respecter of persons. Pause, I beseech you, and reflect. The present excitement will soon be over. The voice of conscience will at last be heard. And in some season of honest thought, even in this world, as you review the scenes of this hour, you will be compelled to say, He was right. He was right. But you have been exhorted to be lenient and compassionate, and in driving me away to affix no unnecessary disgrace upon me. Sir, I reject all such compassion. You cannot disgrace me. Scandal, falsehood, and calumny have already done their worst. My shoulders have borne the burthen till it sits easy upon them. You may hang me up as the mob hung up the individuals of Vicksburg. You may burn me at the stake as they did Mackintosh at St. Louis. Or you may tar and feather me or throw me into the Mississippi as you have often threatened to do. But you cannot disgrace me. I and I alone can disgrace myself. And the deepest of all disgrace would be, at times like this, to deny my master by forsaking his cause. He died for me, and I were most unworthy to bear his name, should I refuse, if need be, to die for him. Again, you have been told that I have a family who are dependent on me, and this has been given as a reason why I should be driven off as gently as possible. It is true, Mr. Chairman, I am a husband and a father. And this it is that adds the bitterest ingredient to the cup of sorrow I am called to drink. I am made to feel the wisdom of the Apostle's advice. It is better not to marry. I know, sir, that in this contest I stake not my life only, but that of others also. I do not expect my wife will ever recover the shock received at the awful scenes through which she was called to pass at St. Charles. And how was it the other night on my return to my house? I found her driven to the garret through a fear of the mob, who were prowling round my house, and scarcely had I entered the house ere my windows were broken in by the brickbats of the mob, and she so alarmed that it was impossible for her to sleep or rest that night. I am hunted as a partridge upon the mountains. I am pursued as a felon through your streets, and to the guardian power of the law I look in vain for that protection against violence which even the vilest criminal may claim. Yet think not that I am unhappy. Think not that I regret the choice that I have made. While all around me is violence and tumult, all is peace within. An approving conscience and the rewarding smile of God is a full recompense for all that I forego and all that I endure. 
Yes, sir, I enjoy a peace which nothing can destroy. I sleep sweetly and undisturbed, except when awakened by the brickbats of the mob. No, sir, I am not unhappy. I have counted the cost, and stand prepared freely to offer up my all in the service of God. Yes, sir, I am fully aware of all the sacrifice I make, in here pledging myself to continue this contest to the last. Forgive these tears. I had not intended to shed them, and they flow not for myself, but for others. But I am commanded to forsake father and mother and wife and children for Jesus' sake, and as his professed disciple I stand prepared to do it. The time for fulfilling this pledge in my case, it seems to me, has come. Sir, I dare not flee away from Alton. Should I attempt it, I should feel the angel of the Lord, with his flaming sword, was pursuing me wherever I went. It is because I fear God that I am not afraid of all who oppose me in this city. No, sir, the contest is commenced here, and here it must be finished. Before God and you all, I here pledge myself to continue it, if need be, till death. If I fall, my grave shall be made in Alton. In person, Lovejoy was well informed, in voice and manners refined, and the pathos of this last appeal, uttered in entire simplicity, melted every one present and produced a deep silence. It was one of those moments when the feelings of an audience tremble in the balance, and a grain may incline them to either side. A proposition to support him might have carried, had it been made at that moment. The charm was broken by another minister of the gospel, who rose and delivered a homily on the necessity of compromise, recommending to Mr. Lovejoy a special attention to the example of Paul, who was let down in a basket from a window in Damascus, as if Alton had been a heathen city under a despotic government. The charm once broken, the meeting became tumultuous and excited, and all manner of denunciations were rained down upon abolitionists. The meeting passed the resolutions reported by the committee, and refused to resolve to aid in sustaining the law against illegal violence, and the mob perfectly understood that do what they might, they should have no disturbance. It being now understood that Mr. Lovejoy would not retreat, it was supposed that the crisis of the matter would develop itself when his printing press came on shore. During the following three days there seemed to be something of a reaction. One of the most influential of the mob leaders was heard to say, that it was of no use to go on destroying presses, as there was money enough on East to bring new ones, and that they might as well let the fanatics alone. This somewhat encouraged the irresolute city authorities, and the friends of the press thought if they could get it once landed and safe into the store of Messrs. Godfrey and Gilman, that the crisis would be safely passed. They therefore sent an express to the captain to delay the landing of the boat till three o'clock in the morning and the leaders of the mob, after watching till they were tired, went home. The press was safely landed and deposited, and all supposed that the trouble was safely passed. Under this impression, Mr. Beecher left Alton and returned home. We will give a few extracts from Mr. Beecher's narrative, which describe his last interview with Mr. Lovejoy on that night, after they had landed and secured the press. Shortly after the hour fixed on for the landing of the boat, Mr. Lovejoy arose and called me to go with him to see what was the result. The moon had set, and it was still dark, but day was near, and here and there a light was glimmering from the window of some sick room or of some early riser. The streets were empty and silent, and the sounds of our feet echoed from the walls as we passed along. Little did he dream at that hour of the content which the next night would witness, that these same streets would echo with the shouts of an infuriate mob, and be stained with his own heart's blood. We found the boat there, and the press in the warehouse, aided in raising it to the third story. We were all rejoiced that no conflict had ensued, and that the press was safe, and all felt that the crisis was over. We were sure that the store could not be carried by storm by so few men as had ever yet acted in a mob, and though the majority of the citizens would not aid to defend the press, we had no fear that they would aid in an attack. So deep was this feeling that it was thought that a small number was sufficient to guard the press afterward, and it was agreed that the company should be divided into sections of six and take turns on successive nights. As they had been up all night, Mr. Lovejoy and myself offered to take charge of the press till morning, and they retired. 
the morning soon began to dawn and that morning i shall never forget who that has stood on the banks of the mighty stream that then rolled before me can forget the emotions of sublimity that filled his heart as in the imagination he has traced those channels of intercourse opened by it and its branches through the illimitable regions of this western world i thought of future ages and of the countless millions that should dwell on this mighty stream and that nothing but the truth would make them free never did i feel as then the value of the right for which we were contending thoroughly to investigate and fearlessly to proclaim that truth oh the sublimity of moral power by it god sways the universe by it he will make the nations free i passed through the scuttle to the roof and ascended to the highest point of the wall the sky and the river were beginning to glow with approaching day and the busy hum of business to be heard I looked with exultation on the scenes below. I felt that a bloodless battle had been gained for God and for the truth, and that Alton was redeemed from eternal shame. And as all around grew brighter with approaching day, I thought of that still brighter sun, even now dawning on the world, and soon to bathe it with floods of glorious light. Brother Lovejoy, too, was happy. He did not exult. He was tranquil and composed, but his countenance indicated the state of his mind. It was a calm and tranquil joy, for he trusted in God that the point was gained, and that the banner of unfettered press would soon wave over that mighty stream. Vain hopes! How soon to be buried in a martyr's grave! Vain, did I say? No, they are not vain. Though dead, he still speaketh, and a united world can never silence his voice. The conclusion of the tragedy is briefly told. A volunteer company, of whom love joy was one, was formed to act under the mayor in defense of the law. The next night the mob assailed the building at ten o'clock. The store consisted of two stone buildings in one block, with doors and windows at each end, but no windows at the sides. The roof was of wood. Mr. Gilman, opening the end door of the third story, asked what they wanted. They demanded the press. He refused to give it up, and earnestly entreated them to go away without violence assuring them that as the property had been committed to their charge, they should defend it at the risk of their lives. After some ineffectual attempts, the mob shouted to set fire to the roof. Mr. Lovejoy, with some others, went out to defend it from this attack, and was shot down by the deliberate aim of one of the mob. After this wound, he had barely strength to return to the store, went up one flight of stairs, fell, and expired. Those within then attempted to capitulate, but were refused with curses by the mob who threatened to burn the store and shoot them as they came out. At length the building was actually on fire, and they fled out, fired on as they went by the mob. So terminated the Alton tragedy. When the noble mother of Lovejoy heard of his death, she said, It is well. I had rather he would die so than forsake his principles. All is not over with America while such mothers are yet left. Was she not blessed who could give up such a son in such a spirit? Who was that woman whom God pronounced blessed above all women? Was it not she who saw her dearest crucified? So differently does God see from what man sees. End of Part 4, Chapter 3「Part 4, Chapter 4 of A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin » by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Chapter 4. Servitude in the Primitive Church Compared with American Slavery. Now look upon this picture, and on this. Hamlet it is the standing claim of those professors of religion at the south who support slavery that they are pursuing the same course in relation to it that christ and the apostles did let us consider the course of christ and his apostles and the nature of the kingdom which they founded and see if this be the fact napoleon said alexander caesar charlemagne and myself have founded empires but upon what did we rest the creation of our genius upon force jesus christ alone founded his empire upon love 
the desire to be above others in power rank and station is one of the deepest in human nature if there is anything which distinguishes man from other creatures it is that he is par excellence an oppressive animal on this principle as napoleon observed all empires have been founded and the idea of founding a kingdom in any other way had not even been thought of when jesus of nazareth appeared when the serene galilean came up from the waters of jordan crowned and glorified by the descending spirit and began to preach saying the kingdom of god is at hand what expectations did he excite men's heads were full of armies to be marshalled of provinces to be conquered of cabinets to be formed and offices to be distributed there was no doubt at all that he would get all these things for them for had he not miraculous power therefore it was that jesus of nazareth was very popular and drew crowds after him of these he chose from the very lowest walk of life twelve men of the best and most honest heart which he could find that he might make them his inseparable companions and moulded them by his sympathy and friendship into some capacity to receive and transmit his ideas to mankind but they too simple-hearted and honest though they were were bewildered and bewitched by the common vice of mankind and though they loved him full well still had an eye on the offices and ranks which he was to confer when as they expected this miraculous kingdom should blaze forth while his heart was struggling and laboring and nerving itself by nights of prayer to meet desertion betrayal denial rejection by his beloved people and ignominious death they were forever wrangling about the offices in the new kingdom once and again in the plainest way he told them that no such thing was to be looked for that there was to be no distinction in his kingdom except the distinction of pain and suffering and self-renunciation voluntarily assumed for the good of mankind his words seemed to them as idle tales in fact they considered him as a kind of myth a mystery a strange supernatural inexplicable being forever talking in parables and saying things which they could not understand one thing only they held fast to he was a king he would have a kingdom and he had told them that they should sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of israel and so when he was going up to jerusalem to die when that anguish long wrestled with in the distance had come almost face to face and he was walking in front of them silent abstracted speaking occasionally in broken sentences of which they feared to ask the meaning they behind beguiled the time with the usual dispute of who should be greatest the mother of james and john came to him and breaking the mournful train of reverie desired a certain thing of him that her two sons might sit at his right hand and his left as prime ministers in the new kingdom with his sad far-seeing eyes still fixed upon gethsemane and calvary he said ye know not what ye ask are ye able to drink of the cup which i shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism wherewith i shall be baptized james and john were both quite certain that they were able they were willing to fight through anything for the kingdom's sake the ten were very indignant were they not as willing as james and john and so there was a contention among them but jesus called them to him and said ye know that the princes of the gentiles exercise dominion over them and their great ones exercise authority upon them but it shall not be so among you whosoever will be great among you let him be your minister and whosoever will be chief among you let him be your servant yea the servant of all for even the son of man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many let us now pass on to another week in this history the disciples have seen their lord enter triumphantly into jerusalem amid the shouts of the multitude an indescribable something in his air and manner convinces them that a great crisis is at hand he walks among men as a descended god never were his words so thrilling and energetic never were words spoken on earth which so breathe and burn as these of the last week of the life of christ all the fervor and imagery and fire of the old prophets seemed to be raised from the dead etherealized and transfigured in the person of this jesus they dare not ask him 
but they are certain that the kingdom must be coming they feel in the thrill of the mighty soul that a great cycle of time is finishing and a new era in the world's history beginning perhaps at this very feast of the passover is the time when the miraculous banner is to be unfurled and the new immortal kingdom proclaimed again the ambitious longings arise this new kingdom shall have ranks and dignities and who is to sustain them while therefore their lord sits lost in thought revolving in his mind that simple ordinance of love which he is about to constitute the sealing ordinance of his kingdom it is said again there was strife among them which should be accounted the greatest this time jesus does not remonstrate he expresses no impatience no weariness no disgust what does he then hear what st john says jesus knowing that the father had given all things into his hand and that he was come from god and went to god he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself after that he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was sat down again he said unto them know ye what i have done to you ye call me master and lord and ye say well for so i am if i then your lord and master have washed your feet ye also ought to wash one another's feet for i have given you an example that ye should do as i have done to you verily verily i say unto you the servant is not greater than his lord neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him if ye know these things happy are ye if ye do them here then we have the king and the constitution of the kingdom the king on his knees at the feet of his servants performing the lowest menial service with the announcement i have given you an example that ye should do as i have done to you and when after the descent of the holy ghost all these immortal words of christ which had lain buried like dead seed in the heart were quickened and sprang up in celestial verdure then these twelve became each one in his place another jesus filled with the spirit of him who had gone heavenward the primitive church as organized by them was a brotherhood of strict equality there was no more contention who should be greatest the only contention was who should suffer and serve the most the christian church was an imperium in imperio submitting outwardly to the laws of the land but professing inwardly to be regulated by a higher faith and a higher law they were dead to the world and the world to them its customs were not their customs its relations not their relations all the ordinary relations of life when they passed into the christian church underwent a quick immortal change so that the transformed relation resembled the old and heathen one no more than the glorious body which is raised in incorruption resembles the mortal one which was sown in corruption the relation of marriage was changed from a tyrannous dominion of the stronger sex over the weaker to an intimate union symbolizing the relation of christ and the church the relation of parent and child purified from the harsh features of heathen law became a just image of the love of the heavenly father and the relation of the master and servant in like manner was refined into a voluntary relation between two equal brethren in which the servant faithfully performed his duties as to the lord and the master gave him a full compensation for his services no one ever doubted that such a relation as this is an innocent one it exists in all free states it is the relation which exists between employer and employed generally in the various departments of life it is true the master was never called upon to perform the legal act of enfranchisement but why because the very nature of the kingdom into which the master and slave had entered enfranchised him it is not necessary for a master to write a deed of enfranchisement when he takes his slaves into canada or even into new york or pennsylvania the moment the master and slave stand together on this soil their whole relations to each other are changed the master may remain master and the servant a servant but according to the constitution of the state they have entered the service must be a voluntary one on the part of the slave and the master must render a just equivalent when the water of baptism passed over the master and the slave 
both alike came under the great constitutional law of christ's empire which is this whosoever will be great among you let him be your minister and whosoever will be chief among you let him be your servant yea the servant of all under such a law servitude was dignified and made honorable but slavery was made an impossibility that the church was essentially and in its own nature such an institution of equality brotherhood love and liberty as made the existence of a slave in the character of a slave in it a contradiction and an impossibility is evident from the general scope and tendency of all the apostolic writings particularly those of paul and this view is obtained not from a dry analysis of greek words and dismal discussions about the meaning of doulos but from a full tide of celestial irresistible spirit full of life and love that breathes in every description of the christian church to all whether bond or free the apostle addresses these inspiring words there is one body and one spirit even as ye are called in one hope of your calling one lord one faith one baptism one god and father of all who is above all and through all and in you all for through him we all have access by one spirit unto the father now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of god and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets jesus christ himself being the chief cornerstone ye are all the children of god by faith in jesus christ there is neither jew nor greek there is neither bond nor free there is neither male nor female for ye are all one in christ jesus for as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of that one body being many are one body so also is christ for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be jews or gentiles whether we be bond or free and whether one member suffer all the members suffer with it or one member be honored all the members rejoice with it it was the theory of this blessed and divine unity that whatever gift or superiority or advantage was possessed by one member was possessed by every member thus paul says to them all things are yours whether paul or apollos or cephas or life or death all are yours and ye are christ's and christ is god's having thus represented the church as one living body inseparably united the apostle uses a still more awful and impressive simile the church he says is one body and that body is the fullness of him who filleth all in all that is he who filleth all in all seeks this church to be the associate and complement of himself even as a wife is of the husband this body of believers is spoken of as a bright and mystical bride in the world but not of it spotless divine immortal raised from the death of sin to newness of life redeemed by the blood of her lord and to be presented at last unto him a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing a delicate and mysterious sympathy is supposed to pervade this church like that delicate and mysterious tracery of nerves that overspreads the human body the meanest member cannot suffer without the whole body quivering in pain thus says paul who was himself a perfect realization of this beautiful theory who is weak and i am not weak who is offended and i burn not to whom ye forgive anything i forgive also but still further individual christians were reminded in language of awful solemnity what know ye not that your body is the temple of the holy ghost which is in you which ye have of god and that ye are not your own and again ye are the temple of the living god as god hath said i will dwell in them and walk in them nor was this sublime language in those days passed over as a mere idle piece of rhetoric but was the ever-present consciousness of the soul every christian was made an object of sacred veneration to his brethren as the temple of the living god the soul of every christian was hushed into awful stillness and inspired to carefulness watchfulness and sanctity by the consciousness of an indwelling god thus ignatius who for his preeminent piety was called par excellence by his church theophorus the god-bearer when summoned before the emperor trajan 
used the following remarkable language. No one can tell Theophorus an evil spirit. For bearing in my heart Christ the King of Heaven, I bring to nothing the arts and devices of the evil spirits. Who, then, is the God-bearer? asked Trajan. He who carries Christ in his heart, was the reply. Dost thou mean him who Pontius Pilate crucified? He is the one I mean, replied Ignatius. Dost thou then bear the crucified one in thy heart, asked Trajan? Even so, said Ignatius, for it is written, I will dwell in them and rest in them. So perfect was the identification of Christ with the individual Christian in the primitive church, that it was a familiar form of expression to speak of an injury done to the meanest Christian as an injury done to Christ. So St. Paul says, When ye sin so against the weak brethren, and wound their weak consciences, ye sin against Christ. He says of himself, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. See also the following extracts from the letter by Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, to some poor Numidian churches who had applied to him to redeem some of their members from slavery among bordering savage tribes. Neander Dunka, 1, 340. We could view the captivity of our brethren no otherwise than as our own, since we belong to one body, and not only love, but religion excites us to redeem in our brethren the members of our own body. We must, even if affection were not sufficient to induce us to keep our brethren, we must reflect that the temples of God are in captivity, and these temples of God ought not, by our neglect, long to remain in bondage. Since the Apostle says, as many of you as are baptized have put on Christ, so in our captive brethren we must see before us Christ, who hath ransomed us from the danger of captivity, who hath redeemed us from the danger of death, him who hath freed us from the abyss of Satan, and who now remains and dwells in us to free him from the hands of barbarians, with a small sum of money to ransom him who hath ransomed us by his cross and blood, and who hath permitted this to take place, that our faith may be proved thereby. Now because the Greek word doulos may mean a slave, and because it is evident that there were men in the Christian church who were called douloi, Will anybody say, in the whole face and genius of this beautiful institution, that these men were held actually as slaves in the sense of Roman and American law? Of all dry, dull, hopeless stupidities, this is the most stupid. Suppose Christian masters did have servants who were called douloi, as is plain enough they did. Is it not evident that the word douloi had become significant of something very different in the Christian church? from what it meant in Roman law? It was not the business of the apostles to make new dictionaries. They did not change words, they changed things. They baptized, regenerated, new created doulos, of one body and one spirit with his master, made one with his master even as Christ is one with the Father, a member of him of that church which is the fullness of him who filleth all in all. Was his relation to his Christian master like that of an American slave to his master? Would he who regarded his weakest brother as being one with Christ hold his brother as a chattel personal? Could he hold Christ as a chattel personal? Could he sell Christ for money? Could he hold the temple of the Holy Ghost as his property and gravely defend his right to sell, lease, mortgage, or hire the same at his convenience? as that right has been argued in the slave-holding pulpits of America, what would have been said at such a doctrine announced in the Christian church? Every member would have stopped his ears and cried out, Judas, if he was pronounced a curse who thought that the gift of the Holy Ghost might be purchased with money. What would have been said of him who held that the very temple of the Holy Ghost might be bought and sold, and Christ the Lord become an article of merchandise? Such an idea never was thought of. It could not have been refuted, for it never existed. It was an unheard of and unsupposable work of the devil, which Paul never contemplated as even possible, that one Christian could claim a right to hold another Christian as merchandise and to trade the member of the body, flesh, and bones of Christ. Such a horrible doctrine never polluted the innocence of the Christian church 
even in thought. The directions which Paul gives to Christian masters and servants sufficiently show what a redeeming change had passed over the institution. In First Timothy, St. Paul gives the following directions, first to those who have heathen masters, second to those who have Christian masters. That concerning heathen masters is thus expressed. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, and the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. In the next verse the direction is given to the servants of Christian masters. They that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. Notice now the contrast between these directions. The servant of the heathen master is said to be under the yoke, and it is evidently implied that the servant of the Christian master was not under the yoke. The servant of the heathen master was under the severe Roman law. The servant of the Christian master is an equal and a brother. In these circumstances, the servant of the heathen master is commanded to obey for the sake of recommending the Christian religion. The servant of the Christian master, on the other hand, is commanded not to despise his master because he is his brother, but he is to do to him service because his master is faithful and beloved, a partaker in the same glorious hopes with himself. Let us suppose now a clergyman employed as a chaplain on a cotton plantation, where most of the members on the plantation, as we are informed is sometimes the case, are members of the same Christian church as their master, should assemble the hands around him and say, Now, boys, I would not have you despise your master because he is your brother. It is true you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is no distinction here. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither Negro nor white man, neither bond nor free. But ye are all brethren, all alike members of Christ, and heirs of the same kingdom. But you must not despise your master on this account. You must love him as a brother, and be willing to do all you can to serve him. Because you see he is a partaker of the same benefit with you, and the Lord loves him as much as he does you. Would not such an address create a certain degree of astonishment both with master and servants? And does not the fact that it seems absurd show that the relation of the slave to his master in American law is a very different one from what it was in the Christian church? But again, let us quote another passage which slave owners are much more fond of. In Colossians 4.22 and 5.1 Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart as fearing God. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Masters, give unto servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Now there is nothing in these directions to servants which would show that they were chattel servants in the sense of slave law for they will apply equally well to every servant in Old England and New England. But there is something in the direction to masters which shows that they were not considered chattel servants by the church, because the master is commanded to give unto them that which is just and equal, as a consideration for their service. Other words, just and equal, just means that which is legally theirs, and equal means that which is in itself equitable, irrespective of law. Now we have the undoubted testimony of all legal authorities on American slave law that American slavery does not pretend to be founded on what is just and equal either. Thus Judge Ruffin says, Merely in the abstract it may well be asked which power of the master accords with right. The answer will probably sweep away all of them. And this principle, so unequivocally asserted by Judge Ruffin, is all along implied and taken for granted, as we have just seen, in all the reasonings upon slavery and the slave law. It would take very little legal acumen to see that the enacting of these words of Paul into a statute by any state would be a practical abolition of slavery in that state. But it is said that St. Paul sent Onesimus back to his master. Indeed, but how? When, to our eternal shame and disgrace, the horrors of the fugitive slave law were being enacted in Boston, and the very cradle of liberty resounded with the groans of the slave, 
and men harder hearted than saul of tarsus made havoc of the church entering into every house hailing men and women committing them to prison when whole churches of humble christians were broken up and scattered like flocks of trembling sheep when husbands and fathers were torn from their families and mothers with poor helpless children fled at midnight with bleeding feet through snow and ice towards canada in the midst of these scenes which have made america a byword and a hissing and an astonishment among all nations there were found men christian men ministers of the gospel of jesus even alas that this should ever be written who standing in the pulpit in the name and by the authority of christ justified and sanctioned these enormities and used this most loving and simple-hearted letter of the martyr paul to justify these unheard-of atrocities he who said who is weak and i am not weak who is offended and i burn not he who called the converted slave his own body the son begotten in his bonds and who sent him to the brother of his soul with the direction receive him as myself not now as a slave but above a slave a brother beloved this beautiful letter this outgush of tenderness and love passing the love of woman was held up to be pawed over by the polluted hobgoblin fingers of slave dealers and slave whippers as their lettre de cachet signed and sealed in the name of christ and his apostles giving full authority to carry back slaves to be tortured and whipped and sold into perpetual bondage as were henry long and thomas sims just as well might a mother's letter when with prayers and tears she commits her first and only child to the cherishing love and sympathy of some trusted friend to be used as an inquisitor's warrant for inflicting imprisonment and torture upon that child had not every fragment of the apostle's body long since mouldered to dust his very bones would have moved in their grave in protest against such slander on the christian name and faith and is it come to this o oh, jesus christ have such things been done in thy name and art thou silent yet verily thou art a god that hidest thyself o god of israel the saviour end of part four chapter four servitude in the primitive church compared with american slavery part four chapter five of a key to uncle tom's cabin by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson teachings and conditions of the apostles but why did not the apostles preach against the legal relation of slavery and seek its overthrow in the state this question is often argued as if the apostles were in the same condition with the clergy of southern churches members of republican institutions lawmakers and possessed of all republican powers to agitate for the repeal of unjust laws contrary to all this a little reading of the new testament will show us that the apostles were almost in the condition of outlaws under a severe and despotic government whose spirit and laws they reprobated as unchristian and to which they submitted just as they exhorted the slave to submit as to a necessary evil here the apostle paul thus enumerating the political privileges incident to the ministry of christ some false teachers had risen in the church at corinth and controverted his teachings asserting that they had greater pretensions to authority in the christian ministry than he st paul defending his apostolic position thus speaks are they ministers of christ i speak as a fool i am more in labors more abundant in stripes above measure in prisons more frequent in deaths oft of the jews five times received i forty stripes save one thrice i was beaten with rods once i was stoned thrice i suffered shipwreck a night and a day have i been in the deep in journeyings often in perils of waters in perils of robbers in perils of by my own countrymen in perils by the heathen in perils in the city in perils in the wilderness in perils in the sea in perils among false brethren in weariness and painfulness in watchings often 
in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. What enumeration of the hardships of an American slave can more than equal the hardships of the great apostle to the Gentiles? He had nothing to do with laws except to suffer their penalties. They were made and kept in operation without asking him, and the slave did not suffer any more from them than he did. It would appear that the clergymen of the South, when they imitate the example of Paul, in letting entirely alone the civil relation of the slave, are left wholly out of their account how different is the position of an American clergyman in a Republican government, where he himself helps make and sustains the laws from the condition of the apostle under a heathen despotism with whose laws he could have nothing to do. It is very proper for an outlawed slave to address other outlawed slaves, exhortations to submit to a government which neither he nor they have any power to alter. We read in sermons which clergymen at the South have addressed to slaves, exhortations to submission, and patience and humility in their enslaved condition, which would be exceedingly proper in the mouth of an apostle, where he and the slaves were like fellow sufferers under a despotism whose laws they could not alter, but which assumed quite another character when addressed to the slave by the very men who make the laws that enslave them. If a man has been waylaid and robbed of all his property, it would be very becoming and proper for his clergyman to endeavor to reconcile him to his condition, as in some sense a dispensation of providence. But if the man who robs him should come to him and address to him the same exhortations, he certainly will think that is quite another phase of the matter. A clergyman of high rank in the church, in a sermon to the Negroes, thus addressed them. Almighty God hath been pleased to make you slaves here, and to give you nothing but labor and poverty in this world, which you are obliged to submit to, as it is his will that it should be so. And think within yourselves what a terrible thing it would be, after all your labors and sufferings in this life, to be turned into hell in the next life, and after wearing out your bodies in service here, to go into a far worse slavery when this is over, and your poor souls be delivered over into the possession of the devil, to become his slaves for ever in hell, without any hope of ever getting free from it. If therefore you would be God's freemen in heaven, you must strive to be good and serve him here on earth. Your bodies, you know, are not your own. They are at the disposal of those you belong to. But your precious souls are still your own, which nothing can take from you, if it be not your own fault. Consider well, then, that if you lose your souls by leading idle, wicked lives here, you have got nothing by it in this world, and you have lost your all in the next. For your idleness and wickedness is generally found out, and your bodies suffer for it here. And what is far worse, if you do not repent and amend, your unhappy souls will suffer for it hereafter. Now this clergyman was a man of undoubted sincerity. He had read the New Testament and observed that St. Paul addressed exhortations something like this to slaves in his day. But he entirely forgot to consider that Paul had not the rights of a Republican clergyman, that he was not a maker and sustainer of those laws by which the slaves were reduced to their condition, but only a fellow sufferer under them. A case may be supposed which would illustrate this principle to the clergyman. Suppose that he were traveling along the highway with all his worldly property about him, in the shape of bank bills. An association of highwaymen seize him, bind him to a tree, and take away the whole of his worldly estate. This they would have precisely the same right to do that the clergyman and his brother Republicans have to take all the earnings and possessions of their slaves. The property would belong to those highwaymen by exactly the same kind of title not because they have earned it, but simply because they have got it and are able to keep it. The head of this confederation, observing some dissatisfaction upon the face of the clergyman, proceeds to address him a religious exhortation to patience and submission, in much the same terms as he had before addressed to the slaves. Almighty God has been pleased to take away your entire property, and to give you nothing but labor and poverty in this world, which you are obliged to submit to, as it is his will that it should be so. 
now think within yourself what a terrible thing it would be if having lost all your worldly property you should be discontent and want resignation lose also your soul and having been robbed of all your property here to have your poor soul delivered over to the possession of the devil to become his property for ever in hell without any hope of ever getting free from it your property now is no longer your own we have taken possession of it but your precious soul is still your own and nothing can take it from you but your own fault consider well then that if you lose your soul by rebellion and murmuring against this dispensation of providence you will get nothing by it in this world and will lose your all in the next now should this clergyman say as he might very properly to these robbers there is no necessity for my being poor in this world if you will only give me back my property which you have taken from me he is only saying precisely what the slaves to whom he has been preaching might say to him and his fellow republicans end of chapter five teachings and condition of the apostles part four chapter six of a key to uncle tom's cabin by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson part four chapter six apostolic teaching on emancipation but it may still be said that the apostles might have commanded christian masters to perform the act of legal emancipation in all cases certainly they might and it is quite evident that they did not the professing primitive christian regarded and treated his slave as a brother but in the eye of the law he was still his chattel personal a thing and not a man why did not the apostles then strike at the legal relation why did they not command every christian convert to sunder that chain at once in answer we may say that every attempt at reform which comes from god has proceeded uniformly in this manner to destroy the spirit of an abuse first and leave the form of it to drop away of itself afterwards to girdle the poisonous tree and leave it to take its own time for dying this mode of dealing with abuses has this advantage that it is compendious and universal and can apply to that particular abuse in all ages and under all shades and modifications if the apostle in that outward and physical age had merely attacked the legal relation and had rested the whole burden of obligation on dissolving that the corrupt and selfish principle might have run into other forms of oppression equally bad and sheltered itself under the technicality of avoiding legal slavery god therefore dealt a surer blow at the monster by singling out the precise spot where the heart beat and saying to his apostles strike there instead of saying to the slaveholder manumit your slave he said to him treat him as your brother and left to the slaveholder's conscience to say how much was implied in this command in the directions which paul gave about slavery it is evident that he considered the legal relation with the same indifference with which a gardener treats a piece of unsightly bark which he perceives the growing vigour of a young tree is about to throw off by its own vital force he looked upon it as a part of an old effete system of heathenism belonging to a set of laws and usages which were waxing old and ready to vanish away there is an argument which has been much employed on this subject and which is specious it is this that the apostles treated slavery as one of the lawful relations of life like that of parent and child husband and wife the argument is thus stated the apostles found all the relations of life much corrupted by various abuses they did not attack the relations but reformed the abuses and thus restored the relations to a healthy state the mistake here lies in assuming that slavery is the lawful relation slavery is the corruption of a lawful relation the lawful relation is servitude and slavery is the corruption of servitude when the apostles came all the relations of life in the roman empire were thoroughly permeated with the principle of slavery the relation of child to parent was slavery the relation of wife to husband was slavery the relation of servant to master was slavery the power of the father over his son by roman law was very much the same with the power of the master over his slave 
he could at his pleasure scourge imprison and put him to death the son could possess nothing but what was the property of his father and this unlimited control extended through the whole lifetime of the father unless the son were formally liberated by an act of manumission three times repeated while the slave could be manumitted by performing the act only once neither was there any law obliging the father to manumit he could retain this power if he chose during his whole life very similar was the situation of the roman wife in case she were accused of crime her husband assembled a meeting of her relations and in their presence sat in judgment upon her awarding such punishment as he thought proper for unfaithfulness to her marriage vow or for drinking wine romulus allowed her husband to put her to death from this slavery unlike the son the wife could never be manumitted no legal forms were provided it was lasting as her life the same spirit of force and slavery pervaded the relation of master and servant giving rise to that severe code of slave law which with few features of added cruelty christian america in the nineteenth century has re-enacted with regard now to all these abuses of proper relations the gospel pursued one uniform course it did not command the christian father to perform the legal act of emancipation to his son but it infused such a divine spirit into the paternal relation by assimilating it to the relation of the heavenly father that the christianized roman would regard any use of his barbarous and oppressive legal powers as entirely inconsistent with his christian profession so it ennobled the marriage relation by comparing it to the relation between christ and his church commanding the husband to love his wife even as christ loved the church and gave himself for it it said to him no man ever hated his own flesh but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the lord the church so ought every one to love his wife even as himself not an allusion is made to the barbarous unjust power which the law gave the husband it was perfectly understood that a christian husband could not make use of it in conformity with these directions in the same manner christian masters were exhorted to give to their servants that which is just and equitable and so far from coercing their services by force to forbear even threatenings the christian master was directed to receive his christianized slave not now as a slave but above a slave a brother beloved and as in all these other cases nothing was said to him about the barbarous powers which the roman law gave him since it was perfectly understood that he could not at the same time treat him as a brother beloved and as a slave in the sense of roman law when therefore the question is asked why did not the apostles seek the abolition of slavery we answer they did seek it they sought it by the safest shortest and most direct course which could possibly have been adopted end of section four chapter six part four chapter seven of a key to uncle tom's cabin by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson abolition of slavery by christianity but did christianity abolish slavery as a matter of fact we answer it did let us look at these acknowledged facts at the time of the coming of christ slavery extended over the whole civilized world captives in war were uniformly made slaves and as wars were of constant occurrence the ranks of slavery were continually being reinforced and as slavery was hereditary and perpetual there was every reason to suppose that the number would have gone on increasing indefinitely had not some influence operated to stop it this is one fact let us now look at another at the time of the reformation chattel slavery had entirely ceased throughout all the civilized countries of the world by no particular edict by no special laws of emancipation but by the steady influence of some gradual unseen power this whole vast system had dissolved away like the snowbanks of winter these two facts being conceded the inquiry arises what caused this change if now we find that the most powerful organization in the civilized world at that time did pursue a system of measures which had 
a direct tendency to bring about such a result, we shall very naturally ascribe it to that organization. The Spanish writer Balmes, in his work entitled Protestantism Compared with Catholicity, has one chapter devoted to the anti-slavery course of the Church, in which he sets forth the whole system of measures which the Church pursued in reference to this subject, and quotes in their order all the decrees of councils. The decrees themselves are given in an appendix at length, in the original Latin. We cannot but sympathize deeply in the noble and generous spirit in which these chapters are written, and the enlarged and vigorous ideas which they give of the magnanimous and honorable nature of Christianity. They are evidently conceived by a large and noble soul, capable of understanding such views, a soul grave, earnest, deeply religious, though evidently penetrated and imbued with the most profound conviction of the truth of his own peculiar faith. We shall give a short abstract from Mr. Balmes of the early course of the Church. In contemplating the course which the Church took in this period, certain things are to be borne in mind, respecting the character of the times. The process was carried on during that stormy and convulsed period of society which succeeded the breaking up of the Roman Empire. At this time all the customs of society were rude and barbarous. Though Christianity as a system had been nominally very extensively embraced, yet it had not, as in the case of its first converts, penetrated to the heart and regenerated the whole nature. Force and violence was the order of the day, and the Christianity of the savage northern tribes, who at this time became masters of Europe, was mingled with the barbarities of their ancient heathenism. To root the institution of slavery out of such a state of society required, of course, a very different process from what would be necessary under the enlightened organization of modern times. No power but one of the peculiar kind which the Christian church then possessed could have effected anything in this way. The Christian church at this time, far from being in the outcast and outlawed state in which it existed in the time of the apostles, was now an organization of great power, and of a kind of power peculiarly adapted to that rude and uncultured age. It laid hold of all those elements of fear and mystery and superstition, which are strongest in barbarous ages, as with barbarous individuals, and it visited the violations of its commands, with penalties the more dreaded that they related to some awful future, dimly perceived and imperfectly comprehended. In dealing with slavery, the Church did not commence by a proclamation of universal emancipation, because such was the barbarous and unsettled nature of the times, so fierce the grasp of violence, and so many the causes of discord, that she avoided adding to the confusion by infusing into it this element. Nay, a certain council of the Church forbade, on pain of ecclesiastical censure, those who preached that slaves ought immediately to leave their masters. The course was commenced first by restricting the power of the master, and granting protection to the slave. The Council of Orleans, in 549, gave to a slave threatened with punishment the privilege of taking sanctuary in a church, and forbade his master to withdraw him thence, without taking a solemn oath that he would do no harm, and if he violated the spirit of this oath, he was to be suspended from the church and the sacraments, a doom which in those days was viewed with such a degree of superstitious awe that the most barbarous would scarcely dare to incur it. The custom was afterwards introduced of requiring an oath on such occasions, not only that the slave should be free from corporal infliction, but that he should not be punished by an extra imposition of labor, or by any badge of disgrace. When this was complained of, as being altogether too great a concession on the side of the slave, the utmost that could be extorted from the church by way of retraction was this, that in cases of very heinous offense, the master should not be required to make the two latter promises. There was a certain punishment among the Goths, which was more dreaded than death. It was the shaving of the hair. This was considered as inflicting a lasting disgrace. If a Goth once had his hair shaved, it was all over with him. The 15th canon of the Council of Merida, in 666, forbade ecclesiastics to inflict this punishment upon their slaves, as also all other kind of violence, and ordained that if a slave committed an offense, he should not be subject to private vengeance, but be delivered up to the secular tribunal, 
and that the bishop should use their power only to procure a moderation of the sentence this was substituting public justice for personal vengeance a most important step the church further enacted by two councils that the master who of his own authority should take the life of his slave should be cut off for two years from the communion of the church a condition in the view of those times implying the most awful spiritual risk separating the man in the eye of society from all that was sacred and teaching him to regard himself and others to regard him as being loaded with the weight of a most tremendous sin besides the protection given to life and limb the church threw her shield over the family condition of the slave by old roman law the slave could not contract a legal inviolable marriage the church of that age availed itself of the catholic idea of the sacramental nature of marriage to conflict with this heathenish doctrine pope adrian i said according to the words of the apostle as in jesus christ we ought not to deprive either slave or free men of the sacraments of the church so it is not allowed in any way to prevent the marriage of slaves and if their marriages have been contracted in spite of the opposition and repugnance of their masters nevertheless they ought not to be dissolved st thomas was of the same opinion for he openly maintains that with respect to contracting marriage slaves are not obliged to obey their masters it can easily be seen what an effect was produced when the personal safety and family ties of the slaves were thus proclaimed sacred by an authority which no man living dared dispute it elevated the slave in the eyes of his master and awoke hope and self-respect in his own bosom and powerfully tended to fit him for the reception of that liberty to which the church by many avenues was constantly seeking to conduct him another means which the church used to procure emancipation was a jealous care of freedom to those already free every one knows how in our southern states the boundaries of slavery are continually increasing for want of some power there to perform the same kind office the liberated slave travelling without his papers is continually in danger of being taken up thrown into jail and sold to pay his jail fees he has no bishop to help him out of his troubles in no church can he take sanctuary hundreds and thousands of helpless men and women are every year engulfed in slavery in this manner the church at this time took all enfranchised slaves under her particular protection the act of enfranchisement was made a religious service and was solemnly performed in the church and then the church received the newly made free man to her protecting arms and guarded his newly acquired rights by her spiritual power the first council of orange held in four forty one ordained in its seventh canon that the church should check by ecclesiastical censures whoever desired to reduce to any kind of servitude slaves who had been emancipated within the enclosure of the church a century later the same prohibition was repeated in the seventh canon of the fifth council of orleans held in five forty nine the protection given by the church to freed slaves was so manifest and known to all that the custom was introduced of especially recommending them to her either in lifetime or by will the council of agde in languedoc passed a resolution commanding the church in all cases of necessity to undertake the defences of those to whom their masters had in a lawful way given liberty another anti-slavery measure which the church pursued with distinguished zeal had the same end in view that is the prevention of the increase of slavery it was the ransoming of captives as at that time it was customary for captives in war to be made slaves of unless ransomed and as owing to the unsettled state of societies wars were frequent slavery might have been indefinitely prolonged had not the church made the greatest efforts in this way the ransoming of slaves in those days held the same place in the affections of pious and devoted members of the church that the enterprise of converting the heathen now does many of the most eminent christians in their excess of zeal even sold themselves into captivity that they might redeem distressed families chateaubriand describes a christian priest in france who voluntarily devoted himself to slavery for the ransom of a christian soldier and thus restored a husband to his desolate wife and a father to three unfortunate children such were the deeds which secured to men in those days the honor of saintship such was the history of saint zachary 
whose story drew tears from many eyes and excited many hearts to imitate so sublime a charity in this they did but imitate the spirit of the early christians for the apostolic clement says we know how many among ourselves have given up themselves unto bonds and thereby they might free others from them first letter to the corinthians section fifty five or chapter twenty one one of the most distinguished of the frankish bishops was st eloy he was originally a goldsmith of remarkable skill in his art and by his integrity and trustworthiness won the particular esteem and confidence of king clotaire the first and stood high in his court of him neander speaks as follows the cause of the gospel was to him the dearest interest to which everything else was made subservient while working at his art he always had a bible open before him the abundant income of his labors he devoted to religious objects and deeds of charity whenever he heard of captives who in these days were often dragged off in troops as slaves that were to be sold at auction he hastened to the spot and paid down their price alas for our slave coffles there are no such bishops now sometimes by his means a hundred at once men and women thus obtained their liberty he then left it to their choice either to return home or to remain with him as free christian brethren or to become monks in the first case he gave them money for their journey in the last which pleased him most he took pains to procure them a handsome reception into some monastery so great was the zeal of the church for the ransom of unhappy captives that even the ornaments and sacred vessels of the church were sold for their ransom by the fifth canon of the council of Macon, held in five eighty five it appears that the priests devoted church property to this purpose the council of rheims held in six twenty five orders the punishment of suspension on the bishop who shall destroy the sacred vessels for any other motive than the ransom of captives and in the twelfth canon of the council of Verneu, held in eight forty four we find that the property of the church was still used for this benevolent purpose when the church had thus redeemed the captive she still continued him under her special protection giving him letters of recommendation which should render his liberty safe in the eyes of all men the council of lyon held in five eighty three and acts that bishops shall state in the letters of recommendation which they give to redeemed slaves the date and price of their ransom the zeal for this work was so ardent that some of the clergy even went so far as to induce captives to run away a council called that of st patrick held in ireland condemns this practice and says that the clergyman who desires to ransom captives must do so with his own money for to induce them to run away was to expose the clergy to be considered as robbers which was a dishonor to the church the disinterestedness of the church in this work appears from the fact that when she had employed her funds for the ransom of captives she never exacted from them any recompense even when they had it in their power to discharge the debt in the letters of st gregory he reassures some persons who had been freed by the church and who feared they should be called upon to refund the money which had been expended on them the pope orders that no one at any time shall venture to disturb them or their heirs because the sacred canons allow for the employment of the goods of the church for the ransom of captives fifty seven epistle fourteen still further to guard against the increase of the number of slaves the council of lyon in five sixty six excommunicated those who unjustly retained free persons in slavery if there were any such laws in the southern states and all were excommunicated who are doing this there would be quite a sensation as some recent discoveries show in six twenty five the council of rheims decreed excommunication to all those who pursue free persons in order to reduce them to slavery the twenty seventh canon of the council of london held in eleven o two forbade the barbarous custom of trading in men like animals and the seventh canon of the council of coblentz held nine twenty two declares that he who takes away a christian to sell him is guilty of homicide a french council held at vermeule in six sixteen established the law that all persons who had been sold into slavery on account of poverty or debt should receive back their liberty by the restoration of the price which had been paid it will readily be seen that this opened a wide field for restoration to liberty 
in an age where so great a christian zeal had been awakened for the redeeming of slaves since it afforded opportunity for christians to interest themselves in raising the necessary ransom at this time the jews occupied a very peculiar place among the nations the spirit of trade and commerce was almost entirely confined to them and the great proportion of the wealth was in their hands and of course many slaves the regulations which the church passed relative to the slaves of jews tended still further to strengthen the principles of liberty they forbade jews to compel christian slaves to do things contrary to the religion of christ they allowed christian slaves who took refuge in the church to be ransomed by paying their masters the proper price this produced abundant results in favor of liberty inasmuch as they gave christian slaves the opportunity of flying to churches and there employing the charity of their brethren they also enacted that a jew who should pervert a christian slave should be condemned to lose all his slaves this was a new sanction to the slave's conscience and a new opening for liberty after that they proceeded to forbid jews to have christian slaves and it was allowed to ransom those in their possession for twelve sous as the jews were among the greatest traders of the time the forbidding them to keep slaves was a very decided step toward general emancipation another means of lessening the ranks of slavery was a decree passed in a council at rome in five ninety five presided over by pope gregory the great the decree offered liberty to all who desired to embrace the monastic life this decree it is said led to great scandal as slaves fled from the houses of their masters in great numbers and took refuge in monasteries the church also ordained that any slave who felt a calling to enter the ministry and appeared qualified therefore should be allowed to pursue his vocation and enjoined it upon his masters to liberate him since the church could not permit her minister to wear the yoke of slavery it is to be presumed that the phenomena on page one seventy six of a preacher with both toes cut off and branded on the breast advertised as a runaway in the public papers was not one which could have occurred consistently with the christianity of that period under the influence of all these regulations it is not surprising that there are documents cited by m balmas which go to show the following things first that the number of slaves thus liberated was very great as there was universal complaint upon this head second that the bishops were complained of as being always in favor of the slaves as carrying their protection to very great lengths laboring in all ways to realize the doctrine of man's equality and it is affirmed in the documents that complaint is made that there is hardly a bishop who cannot be charged with reprehensible compliances in favor of slaves and that slaves were aware of this spirit of protection and were ready to throw off their chains and cast themselves into the church it is not necessary longer to extend this history it is perfectly plain whither such a course tends and it is whither the course pursued by the american clergy at the south tends we are not surprised that under such a course on the one hand the number of slaves decreased till there were none in modern europe we are not surprised by such a course on the other hand that they have increased until there are three millions in america alas for the poor slave what church befriends him in what house of prayer can he take sanctuary what holy men stand forward to rebuke the wicked law that denies him legal marriages what pious bishops visit slave coffles to redeem men women and children to liberty what holy exhortations in churches to buy the freedom of wretched captives when have church velvets been sold and communion cups melted down to liberate the slave where are the pastors inflamed with the love of jesus who have sold themselves into slavery to restore separated families where are those honorable complaints of the world that the church is always on the side of the oppressed that the slaves feel the beatings of her generous heart and long to throw themselves into her arms love of brethren holy charities love of jesus where are ye are ye fled for ever end of chapter seven abolition of slavery by christianity part four chapter eight of a key to uncle tom's cabin by harriet beecher stowe 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Chapter 8 Justice and Equity versus Slavery. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal. From what has been said in the last chapter, it is presumed that it will appear that the Christian Church of America by no means occupies that position, with regard to slavery, that the apostles did, or that the Church of the earlier ages did. However they may choose to interpret the language of the apostles, the fact still remains undeniable that the Church organization which grew up immediately after these instructions did intend and did effect the abolition of slavery but we wish to give still further consideration to one idea which is often put forward by those who defend american slavery it is this that the institution is not of itself a sinful one and that the only sin consists in the neglect of its relative duties all that is necessary they say is to regulate the institution by the precepts of the gospel they admit that no slavery is defensible which is not so regulated if therefore it shall appear that american slave law cannot be regulated by the precepts of the gospel without such alterations as will entirely do away the whole system then it will appear that it is an unchristian institution against which every christian is bound to remonstrate and from which he should entirely withdraw the roman slave code was a code made by heathen by a race too proverbial stern and unfeeling it was made in the darkest ages of the world before the light of the gospel had dawned christianity gradually but certainly abolished it some centuries later a company of men from christian nations go to the continent of africa there they kindle wars sow strifes set tribes against tribes with demonic violence burn villages and in the midst of these diabolical scenes kidnap and carry off from time to time hundreds and thousands of miserable captives such of those as do not die of terror grief suffocation ship fever and other horrors are from time to time landed on the shores of america here they are and now a set of christian legislators meet together to construct a system of laws of servitude with regard to these unfortunates which is hereafter to be considered as a christian institution of course in order to have any valid title to such a name the institution must be regulated by the principles which christ and his apostles have laid down for the government of those who assume the relation of masters the new testament sums up these principles in a single sentence masters give unto your servants that which is just and equal but forasmuch as there is always some confusion of mind in regard to what is just and equal in our neighbor's affairs our lord has given this direction by which we may arrive at infallible certainty all things whatsoever ye would that men do to you do ye even so to them it is therefore evident that if christian legislators are about to form a christian system of servitude they must base it upon these two laws one of which is a particular specification under the other let us now examine some of the particulars of the code which they have formed and see if it bear this character first they commence by declaring that their brother shall no longer be considered as a person but deemed sold taken and reputed as a chattel personal this is just and equal this being the fundamental principle of the system the following are specified as its consequences one that he shall have no right to hold property of any kind under any circumstances just and equal two that he shall have no power to contract a legal marriage or claim any woman in particular for his wife just and equal three that he shall have no right to his children either to protect restrain guide or educate just and equal four that the power of his master over him shall be absolute without any possibility of appeal or redress in consequence of any injury whatever to secure this they enact that he shall not be able to enter suit in any court for any cause just and equal 
that he shall not be allowed to bear testimony in any court where any white person is concerned just and equal that the owner of a servant for malicious cruel and excessive beating of his slave cannot be indicted just and equal it is further decided that by no indirect mode of suit through a guardian shall a slave obtain redress for ill treatment dorothea versus coquillian et al nine martin l a rep three fifty just and equal five it is decided that the slave shall not only have no legal redress for injuries inflicted by his master but shall have no redress for those inflicted by any other person unless the injury impair his property value just and equal under this head it is distinctly asserted as follows there can be no offence against the peace of the state by the mere beating of a slave unaccompanied by any circumstances of cruelty or an intent to kill and murder the peace of the state is not thereby broken state versus manor two hills rep s c just and equal if a slave strike a white he is to be condemned to death but if a master kill his slave by torture no white witnesses being present he may clear himself by his own oath louisiana just and equal the law decrees fine and imprisonment to the person who shall release the servant of another from the torture of the iron collar louisiana just and equal it decrees a much smaller fine without imprisonment to the man who shall torture him with red-hot irons cut out his tongue put out his eyes and scald or maim him ibid just and equal it decrees the same punishment to him who teaches him to write as to him who puts out his eyes just and equal as it might be expected that only very ignorant and brutal people could be kept in a condition like this especially in a country where every book and every newspaper are full of dissertations on the rights of man they therefore enact laws that neither he nor his children to all generations shall learn to read and write just and equal and as if allowed to meet for religious worship they might concert some plan of escape or redress they enact that no congregation of negroes under pretense of divine worship shall assemble themselves and that every slave found at such meetings shall be immediately corrected without trial by receiving on the bare back twenty-five stripes with a whip switch or cowskin law of georgia prince's digest page four forty seven just and equal though the servant is thus kept in ignorance nevertheless in his ignorance he is punished more severely for the same crimes than freemen just and equal by way of protecting him from overwork the enact that he shall not labor more than five hours longer than convicts at hard labor in a penitentiary they also enact that the master or overseer not the slave shall decide when he is too sick to work just and equal if any master compassionating this condition of the slave desires to better it the law takes it out of his power by the following decisions one that all his earnings shall belong to his master notwithstanding his master's promise to the contrary thus making them liable for his master's debts just and equal two that if his master allows him to keep cattle for his own use it shall be lawful for any man to take them away and enjoy half the profits of the seizure just and equal three if his master sets him free he shall be taken up and sold again just and equal if any man or woman runs away from this state of things and after proclamation made does not return any two justices of the peace may declare them outlawed and give permission to any person of the community to kill them by any ways or means they think fit just and equal such are the laws of that system of slavery which has been made up by christian masters late in the christian era and is now defended by christian ministers as an eminently benign institution in this manner christian legislators have expressed their understanding of the text masters give unto your servants that which is just and equal and of the text all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you do ye even so to them 
it certainly presents the most extraordinary view of justice and equity and is the most remarkable exposition of the principle of doing to others as we would others do to us that it has ever been the good fortune of the civilized world to observe this being the institution let any one conjecture what its abuses must be for we are gravely told by learned clergymen that they do not feel called upon to interfere with the system but only with its abuses we should like to know what abuse could be specified that is not provided for and expressly protected by slave law and yet christian republicans who with full power to repeal this law are daily sustaining it talk about there being no harm in slavery if they regulate it according to the apostles directions and give unto their servants that which is just and equal do they think that if the christianized masters of rome and corinth had made such a set of rules as this for the government of their slaves paul would have accepted it as a proper exposition of what he meant by just and equal but the presbyteries of south carolina say and all other religious bodies of the south say that the church of our lord jesus christ has no right to interfere with civil institutions what is this church of our lord jesus christ they speak of is it not a collection of republican men who have constitutional power to alter these laws and whose duty it is to alter them and who are disobeying the apostles direction every day till they do alter them every master at the south is a voter as much as he is a minister every church member is a voter as much as he is a church member and ministers and church members are among the masters who are keeping up this system of atrocity when they have full republican power to alter it and yet they talk about giving their servants that which is just and equal if they are going to give their servants that which is just and equal let them give them back their manhood they are lawmakers and can do it let them give to the slave the right to hold property the right to form legal marriage the right to read the word of god and to have such education as will fully develop his intellectual and moral nature the right of free religious opinion and worship let them give him the right to bring suit and to bear testimony give him the right to have some vote in the government by which his interests are controlled this will be something more like giving him that which is just and equal mr smiley of mississippi says that the planters of louisiana and mississippi where they are giving from twenty to twenty five dollars a barrel for pork give their slaves three or four pounds a week and intimates that if that will not convince people that they are doing what is just and equal he does not know what will mr c c jones after stating in various places that he has no intention ever to interfere with the civil condition of the slave teaches the negroes in his catechism that the master gives to his servant that which is just and equal when he provides for them good houses good clothing food nursing and religious instruction this is just like a man who has stolen an estate which belongs to a family of orphans out of its munificent revenues he gives the orphans comfortable food clothing etc while he retains the rest for his own use declaring that he is thus rendering to them that which is just and equal if the laws which regulate slavery were made by a despotic sovereign over whose movements the masters could have no control this mode of proceeding might be called just and equal but as they are made and kept in operation by these christian masters these ministers and church members in common with those who are not so they are every one of them refusing to the slave that which is just and equal so long as they do not seek the repeal of these laws and if they cannot get them repealed it is their duty to take the slave out from under them since they are constructed with such fatal ingenuity as utterly to nullify all that the master tries to do for their elevation and permanent benefit no man would wish to leave his own family of children as slaves under the care of the kindest master that ever breathed and what he would not wish to have done to his own children he ought not to do to other people's children but it will be said that it is not becoming for the christian church to enter into political matters again we ask what is the christian church is it not an association of republican citizens 
each one of whom has his rights and duties as a legal voter now suppose a law were passed which depreciated the value of cotton or sugar three cents in the pound would these men consider the fact that they are church members as any reason why they should not agitate for the repeal of such law certainly not such a law would be brittle as the spider's web it would be swept away before it was well made every law to which the majority of the community does not assent is in this country immediately torn down why then does this monstrous system stand from age to age because the community consent to it they reenact these unjust laws every day by their silent permission of them the kingdom of our lord jesus christ is not of this world say the south carolina presbyteries therefore the church has no right to interfere with any civil institution but yet all the clergy of charleston could attend in a body to give sanction to the proceedings of the great vigilance committee they could not properly exert the least influence against slavery because it is a civil institution but they could give the whole right of their influence in favor of it is it not making the kingdom of our lord jesus christ quite as much of this world to patronize the oppressor as to patronize the slave End of chapter 8 Justice and Equity versus Slavery Part 4, Chapter 9 of A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson chapter nine is the system of religion which is taught the slave the gospel the ladies of england in their letter to the ladies of america spoke in particular of the denial of the gospel to the slave this has been indignantly resented in this country and it has been claimed that the slaves do have the gospel communicated to them very extensively whoever reads mr charles c jones book on the religious instruction of the negroes will have no doubt of the following facts one that from year to year since the introduction of the negroes into this country various pious and benevolent individuals have made efforts for their spiritual welfare two that these efforts have increased from year to year three that the most extensive and important one came into being about the time mr jones book was written in the year eighteen forty two and extended to some degree through the united states the fairest development of it was probably in the state of georgia the sphere of mr jones immediate labor where the most gratifying results were witnessed a much very amiable and commendable christian feeling elicited on the part of masters Four from time to time there have been prepared for the use of the slave catechisms hymns short sermons etc etc designed to be read to them by their masters or taught them orally five it will appear to any one who read mr jones book though written by a man who believed the system of slavery sanctioned by god it manifests a spirit of sincere and earnest benevolence and of devotedness to the cause he has undertaken which cannot be too highly appreciated it is a very painful and unpleasant task to express any qualifications or dissent with regard to efforts which have been undertaken in a good spirit and which have produced in many respects good results but in the reading of mr jones book in the study of his catechism and of various other catechisms and sermons which give an idea of the religious instruction of the slaves the writer has often been painfully impressed with the idea that however imbued and mingled with good it is not the true and pure gospel system which is given to the slave as far as the writer has been able to trace out what is communicated to him it amounts in substance to this that his master's authority over him and property in him to the full extent of the enactment of the slave law is recognized and sustained by the tremendous authority of god himself he is told that his master is god's overseer that he owes him a blind unconditional unlimited submission that he must not allow himself to grumble 
or fret or murmur at anything in his conduct and in case he does so that his murmuring is not against his master but against god he is taught that it is god's will that he should have nothing but labor and poverty in this world and that if he frets and grumbles at this he will get nothing by it in this life and be sent to hell forever in the next most vivid descriptions of hell with its torments its worms ever feeding and never dying are held up before him and he is told that this eternity of torture will be the result of insubordination here it is no wonder that a slaveholder once said to dr brisbane of cincinnati that religion had been worth more to him on his plantation than a wagon load of cowskins furthermore the slave is taught that to endeavor to evade his master by running away or to shelter or harbor a slave who has run away are sins which will expose him to the wrath of that omniscient being whose eyes are in every place as the slave is a movable and merchantable being liable as mr jones calmly remarks to all the vicissitudes of property this system of instruction one would think would be in something of a dilemma when it comes to inculcate the christian duties of the family state when mr jones takes a survey of the field previous to commencing his system of operations he tells us what we suppose every rational person must have foreseen that he finds among the negroes an utter demoralization upon this subject that polygamy is commonly practiced and that the marriage covenant has become a mere temporary union of interest profit or pleasure formed without reflection and dissolved without the slightest idea of guilt that this state of things is the necessary and legitimate result of the system of laws which these christian men have made and are still keeping up over their slaves any sensible person will perceive and one would think it an indispensable step to any system of religious instruction here that the negro should be placed in a situation where he can form a legal marriage and can adhere to it after it is formed but mr jones and his coadjutors commenced by declaring that it was not their intention to interfere in the slightest degree with the legal position of the slave we should have thought then that it would not have been possible if these masters intended to keep their slaves in the condition of chattels personal liable to a constant disruption of family ties that they could have the heart to teach them the strict morality of the gospel with regard to the marriage relation but so it is however if we examine mr jones catechism we shall find that the slave is made to repeat orally that one man can be the husband of but one woman and if during her lifetime he marries another god will punish him forever in hell suppose a conscientious woman instructed in mr jones catechism by the death of her master is thrown into the market for the division of the estate like many cases we may read of in the georgia papers every week she is torn from her husband and children and sold at the other end of the union never to meet them again and the new master commands her to take another husband what now is this woman to do if she take the husband according to her catechism she commits adultery and exposes herself to everlasting fire if she does not take him she disobeys her master who she has been taught is god's overseer and she is exposed to everlasting fire on that account and certainly she is exposed to horrible tortures here now we ask if the teaching that has involved this poor soul in such a labyrinth of horrors can be called the gospel is it the gospel is it glad tidings in any sense of the words in the same manner this catechism goes on to instruct parents to bring up their children in the nurture and admonition of the lord that they should guide counsel restrain and govern them again these teachers tell them that they should search the scriptures most earnestly diligently and continually at the same time declaring that it is not their intention to interfere with the laws which forbid their being taught to read searching the scriptures slaves are told means coming to the people who are willing to read them yes but if there be no one willing to do this what then any one whom this catechism has thus instructed is sold off to a plantation on red river like that where northrop lived no bible goes with him his christian instructors in their care not to interfere with his civil condition 
have deprived him of the power of reading and in this land of darkness his oral instruction is but a faded dream let any of us ask for what sum we would be deprived of all power of ever reading the bible for ourselves and made entirely dependent upon the reading of others especially if we were liable to fall into such hands as slaves are and then let us determine whether a system of religious instruction which begins by declaring that it has no intention to interfere with this cruel legal deprivation is the gospel the poor slave darkened blinded perplexed on every hand by the influences which the legal system has spread under his feet is furthermore strictly instructed in a perfect system of morality he must not even covet anything that is his master's he must not murmur or be discontented he must consider his master's interests as his own and be ready to sacrifice himself to them and this he must do as he is told not only to the good and gentle but also to the froward he must forgive all injuries and do exactly right under all perplexities thus is the obligation on his part expounded to him while his master's reciprocal obligations mean only to give him good houses clothes food etc etc leaving every master to determine for himself what is good in relation to these matters no wonder when such a system of utter injustice is justified to the negro by all the awful sanctions of religion that now and then a strong soul rises up against it we have known under a black skin shrewd minds unconquerable spirits whose indignant sense of justice no such representations could blind that mr jones has met such is evident for speaking of the trials of a missionary among them he says page one twenty seven he discovers deism skepticism universalism as already stated the various provisions of the gospel and all the strong objections against the truth of god objections which he may perhaps have considered peculiar only to the cultivated minds the ripe scholarship and profound intelligence of critics and philosophers extremes here meet on the natural and common ground of a darkened understanding and a hardened heart again in the truth annual report of the association of the religious instruction of negroes in liberty county georgia he says allow me to relate a fact which occurred in the spring of this year illustrative of the character and knowledge of the negroes at this time i was preaching to a large congregation on the epistle to philemon and when i insisted upon fidelity and obedience as christian virtues and servants and upon the authority of paul condemned the practice of running away one half of my audience deliberately walked off with themselves and those that remained looked anything but satisfied either with the preacher or his doctrine after dismission there was no small stir among them some solemnly declared that there was no such epistle in the bible others that it was not the gospel others that i preached to please masters others that they did not care if they ever heard me preach again pages twenty four twenty five lundy lane an intelligent fugitive who has published his memoirs says that on one occasion they the slaves were greatly delighted with a certain preacher until he told them that god had ordained and created them expressly to make slaves of he says that after that they all left him and went away because they thought with the jews this is a hard saying who can hear it in these remarks on the perversion of the gospel as presented to the slave we do not mean to imply that much that is excellent and valuable is not taught them we mean simply to assert that in so far as the system taught justifies the slave system so far necessarily it vitiates the fundamental ideas of justice and morality and so far as the obligations of the gospel are inculcated on the slave in their purity they bring him necessarily in conflict with the authority of the system as we have said before it is an attempt to harmonize light with darkness and christ with belial nor is such an attempt to be justified and tolerated because undertaken in the most amiable spirit by amiable men our admiration of some of the laborers who have conducted this system is very great so also is our admiration of many of the jesuit missionaries who have spread the roman catholic religion among our aboriginal tribes 
devotion and disinterestedness could be carried no further than some of both these classes of men have carried them but while our respect for these good men must not seduce us as protestants into an admiration of the system which they taught so our esteem for our southern brethren must not lead us to admit that a system which fully justifies the worst kind of spiritual and temporal despotism can properly represent the gospel of him who came to preach deliverance to the captives to prove that we have not misrepresented the style of instruction we will give some extracts from various sermons and discourses in the first place to show how explicitly religious teachers disclaim any intention of interfering in the legal relation see mr jones work page one fifty seven by law or custom they are excluded from the advantages of education and by consequence from the reading of the word of god and this immense mass of immortal beings is thrown for religious instruction upon oral communications entirely and upon whom upon their owners and their owners especially of late years claim to be the exclusive guardians of their religious instruction and the almoners of divine mercy towards them thus assuming the responsibility of their entire christianization all approaches to them from abroad are rigidly guarded against and no ministers are allowed to break to them the bread of life except such as have commended themselves to the affection and confidence of their owners i do not condemn this course of self-preservation on the part of our citizens i merely mention it to show their entire dependence upon ourselves in answering objections of masters to allowing the religious instruction of the negroes he supposes the following objection and gives the following answer if we suffer our negroes to be instructed the tendency will be to change the civil relations of society as now constituted to which let it be replied that we separate entirely their religious and their civil condition and contend that one may be attended to without interfering with the other our principle is that laid down by the holy and just one render unto caesar the things which are caesar's and unto god the things which are god's and christ and his apostles are our example did they deem it proper and consistent with the good order of society to preach the gospel to the servants they did in discharge of this duty did they interfere with their civil condition they did not with regard to the description of heaven and the torments of hell the following is from mr jones catechism pages eighty three ninety one ninety two question are there two places only spoken of in the bible to which the souls of men go after death answer only two question which are they answer heaven and hell question after the judgment is over into what place do the righteous go answer into heaven question what kind of place is heaven answer a most glorious and happy place question shall the righteous in heaven have any more hunger or thirst or nakedness or heat or cold shall they have any more sin or sorrow or crying or pain or death answer no question repeat and god shall wipe away all tears from their eyes answer and god shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away question will heaven be their everlasting home answer yes question and shall the righteous grow in knowledge and holiness and happiness for ever and ever answer yes question to what place should we wish to strive to go more than to all other places answer heaven question into what places are the wicked to be cast answer into hell question repeat the wicked shall be turned answer the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget god question what kind of place is hell answer a place of dreadful torments 
question what does it burn with answer an everlasting fire question who are cast into hell besides wicked men answer the devil and his angels question what will the torments of hell make the wicked do answer weep and wail and gnash their teeth question what did the rich man beg for when he was tormented in the flame answer a drop of cold water to cool his tongue question will the wicked have any good thing in hell the least comfort the least relief from torment answer no question will they ever come out of hell answer no never question can any go from heaven to hell or from hell to heaven answer no question what is fixed between heaven and hell answer a great gulf question what is the punishment of the wicked in hell called answer everlasting punishment question will this punishment make them better answer no question repeat it is a fearful thing answer it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living god question what is god said to be to the wicked answer a consuming fire question what place should we strive to escape from above all others answer hell the reverend alex glenny rector at all saints parish waccamaw south carolina has for several years been in the habit of preaching with express reference to slaves in eighteen forty four he published in charleston a selection of these sermons under the title of sermons preached on plantations to congregations of negroes this book contains twenty-six sermons and in twenty-two of them there is either a more or less extended account or a reference to the eternal misery in hell as a motive to duty he thus describes the day of judgment sermon fifteen page ninety when all people shall be gathered before him he shall separate them one from the other as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats and he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on his left that my brethren will be an awful time when this separation shall be going on when the holy angels at the command of the great judge shall be gathering together all the obedient followers of christ and be setting them on the right hand of the judgment seat and shall place all the remainder on the left remember that each one of you must be present remember that the great judge can make no mistake and that you shall be placed on one side or the other according as in this world you have believed in and obeyed him or not how full of joy and thanksgiving will you be if you shall find yourself placed on the right hand but how full of misery and despair if the left shall be appointed as your portion but what shall he say to the wicked on the left hand to them he shall say depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels he will tell them to depart they did not while here seek him by repentance and faith they did not obey him and now he will drive them from him he will call them cursed sermon one page forty two the death which is the wages of sin is this everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels it is a fire which shall last for ever and the devil and his angels and all people who will not love and serve god shall be punished for ever the bible says the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever the fire is not quenched it never goes out their worm dieth not their punishment is spoken of as a worm always feeding upon but never consuming them it never can stop concerning the absolute authority of the master take the following extract from bishop meade's sermon brooks slavery pages thirty thirty one thirty two having thus shown you the chief duties you owe to your great master in heaven i now come to lay before you the duties you owe to your masters and mistresses here upon earth and for this you have one general rule that you ought always to carry in your minds and that is to do all service for them as if you did it for god himself poor creatures 
you little consider when you are idle and neglectful of your master's business when you steal and waste and hurt any of their substance when you are saucy and impudent when you are telling them lies and deceiving them or when you prove stubborn and sullen and will not do the work you are set about without stripes and vexation you do not consider i say that what faults you are guilty of towards your masters and mistresses are faults done against god himself who hath set your masters and mistresses over you in his own stead and expects that you will do for them just as you would do for him and pray do not think that i want to deceive you when i tell you that your masters and mistresses are god's overseers and that if you are faulty towards them god himself will punish you severely for it in the next world unless you repent of it and strive to make amends by your faithfulness and diligence for the time to come for god himself hath declared the same now from this general rule namely that you are to do all service for your masters and mistresses as if you did it for god himself there arise several other rules of duty towards your masters and mistresses which i shall endeavour to lay out in order before you and in the first place you are to be obedient and subject to your masters in all things and christian ministers are commanded to exhort servants to be obedient unto their masters and to please them well in all things not answering them again or gainsaying you see how strictly god requires this of you that whatever your masters and mistresses order you to do you must set about it immediately and faithfully perform it without any disputing or grumbling and take care to please them well in all things and for your encouragement he tells you that he will reward you for it in heaven because while you are honestly and faithfully doing your master's business here you are serving your lord and master in heaven you see also that you are not to take any exceptions to the behavior of your masters and mistresses and that you are to be subject and obedient not only to such as are good and gentle and mild towards you but also to such as may be forward peevish and hard for you are not at liberty to choose your own masters but into whatever hands god hath been pleased to put you you must do your duty and god will reward you for it you are to be faithful and honest to your masters and mistresses not purloining or wasting their goods or substance but showing all good fidelity in all things do not your masters under god provide for you and how shall they be able to do this to feed and to clothe you unless you take honest care of everything that belongs to them remember that god requires this of you and if you are not afraid of suffering for it here you cannot escape the vengeance of almighty god who will judge between you and your masters and make you pay severely in the next world for all the injustice you do them here and though you could manage so cunningly as to escape the eyes and hands of man yet think what a dreadful thing it is to fall into the hands of the living god who is able to cast both soul and body into hell you are to serve your masters with cheerfulness reverence and humility you are to do your master's service with good will doing it as the will of god from the heart without any sauciness or answering again how many of you do things quite otherwise and instead of going about your work with a good will and a good heart dispute and grumble giving saucy answers and behave in a surly manner there is something so becoming and engaging in a modest cheerful good-natured behavior that a little work done in that manner seems better done and gives far more satisfaction than a great deal more that must be done with fretting vexation and the lash always held over you it also gains the good will and love of those you belong to and makes your own life pass with more ease and pleasure besides you are to consider that this grumbling and ill-will do not affect your masters and mistresses only they have ways and means in their hands of forcing you to do your work whether you are willing or not but your murmuring and grumbling is against god who hath placed you in that service who will punish you severely in the next world for despising his commands a very awful query here occurs to the mind if the poor ignorant slave who wastes his master's temporal goods to answer some of his own present purposes be exposed to this heavy retribution what will become of those educated men who for their temporal convenience make and hold 
enforce laws which rob generation after generation of men not only of their daily earnings but of their rights and privileges as immortal beings the reverend mr glenny in one of his sermons as quoted by mr bowditch page one hundred thirty seven assures his hearers that none of them will be able to say in the day of judgment i had no way of hearing about my good saviour bishop meade as quoted by brooke pages thirty four thirty five thus expiates to slaves on the advantages of their condition one would really think from reading this account that every one ought to make haste and get himself sold into slavery as the nearest road to heaven take care that you do not fret or murmur grumble or repine at your condition for this will not only make your life uneasy but will greatly offend almighty god consider that it is not yourselves it is not the people that you belong to it is not the men that have brought you to it but it is the will of god who hath by his providence made you servants because no doubt he knew that condition would be best for you in this world and help you be better towards heaven if you would but do your duty in it so that any discontent at your not being free or rich or great as you see some others is quarrelling with your heavenly master and finding fault with god himself who hath made you what you are and hath promised you as large a share in the kingdom of heaven as the greatest man alive if you will but behave yourself aright and do the business he hath set you about in this world honestly and cheerfully riches and power have proved the ruin of many an unhappy soul by drawing away the heart and affections from god and fixing them on mean and sinful enjoyments so that when god who knows our hearts better than we know them ourselves sees that they would be hurtful to us and therefore keeps them from us it is the greatest mercy and kindness he could show us you may perhaps fancy that if you had riches and freedom you could do your duty to god and man with greater pleasure than you can now but pray consider that if you can but save your souls through the mercy of god you will have spent your time to the best purposes in this world and he that at last can get to heaven has performed a noble journey let the road be ever so rugged and difficult besides you really have a great advantage over most white people who have not only the care of their daily labor upon their hands but the care of looking forward to providing necessaries for to-morrow and next day and of clothing and bringing up their children and of getting food and raiment for as many of you as belong to their families which often puts them to great difficulties and distracts their minds so as to break their rest and take off their thoughts from the affairs of another world whereas you are quite eased from all these cares and have nothing but your daily labor to look after and when that is done take your needful rest neither is it necessary for you to think of laying up anything against old age as white people are obliged to do for the laws of the country have provided that you shall not be turned off when you are past labor but shall be maintained while you live by those you belong to whether you are able to work or not bishop meade further consoles slaves thus for certain incidents of their lot for which they may think they have more reason to find fault than for most others the reader must admit that he takes a very philosophical view of the subject there is only one circumstance which may appear grievous that i shall now take notice of and that is correction now when correction is given you you either deserve it or you do not deserve it but whether you really deserve it or not it is your duty and almighty god requires that you bear it patiently you may perhaps think that this is hard doctrine but if you consider it right you must needs think otherwise of it suppose then that you deserve correction you cannot but say that it is just and right you should meet with it suppose you do not or at least you do not deserve so much or so severe a correction for the fault you have committed you perhaps have escaped a great many more and at last paid for all or suppose you are quite innocent of what is laid to your charge and suffer wrongfully in that particular thing is it not possible you may have done some other bad thing which was never discovered and that almighty god who saw you doing it would not let you escape without punishment one time or another and ought you not in such a case to give glory to him and be thankful that he would rather punish you in this life for your wickedness 
than destroy your souls for it in the next life but suppose even this was not the case a case hardly to be imagined and that you have by no means known or unknown deserved the correction you suffered there is this great comfort in it that if you bear it patiently and leave your cause in the hands of god he will reward you for it in heaven and the punishment you suffer unjustly here shall turn to your exceeding great glory hereafter that bishop meade has no high opinion of the present comforts of a life of slavery may be fairly inferred from the following remarks which he makes to slaves your own poorer circumstances in this life ought to put you particularly upon this and taking care of your souls for you cannot have the pleasures and enjoyments of this life like rich free people who have estates and money to lay out as they think fit if others will run the hazard of their souls they have a chance of getting wealth and power of heaping up riches and enjoying all the ease luxury and pleasure their hearts should long for but you can have none of these things so that if you sell your souls for the sake of what poor matters you can get in this world you have made a very foolish bargain indeed this information is certainly very explicit and to the point he continues almighty god hath been pleased to make you slaves here and to give you nothing but labor and poverty in this world which you are obliged to submit to as it is his will that it should be so and think within yourselves what a terrible thing it would be after all your labors and sufferings in this life to be turned into hell in the next life and after wearing out your bodies in service here to go into a far worse slavery when this is over and your poor souls be delivered over into the possession of the devil to become his slaves for ever in hell without any hope of ever getting free from it if therefore you would be god's freeman in heaven you must strive to be good and serve him here on earth your bodies you know are not your own they are at the disposal of those you belong to but your precious souls are still your own which nothing can take from you if it be not your own fault consider well then that if you lose your souls by leading idle wicked lives here you have got nothing by it in this world and you have lost your all in the next for your idleness and wickedness is generally found out and your bodies suffer for it here and what is far worse if you do not repent and amend your unhappy souls will suffer for it hereafter mr jones in that part of the work where he is obviating the objections of masters to the christian instruction of their slaves supposes the master to object thus you teach them that god is no respecter of persons that he hath made of one blood all nations of men thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you do ye even so to them what use let me ask would they make of these sentences from the gospel mr jones says let it be replied that the effect urged in the objection might result from imperfect and injudicious religious instruction indeed religious instruction may be communicated with the express design on the part of the instructor to produce the effect referred to instances of which have occurred but who will say that neglect of duty and insubordination are the legitimate effects of the gospel purely and sincerely imparted to servants has it not in all ages been viewed as the greatest civilizer of human race how mr jones would interpret the golden rule to the slave so as to justify the slave system we cannot possibly tell we can however give a specimen of the manner in which it has been interpreted in bishop meade's sermons page one hundred sixteen brooks slavery etc pages thirty two thirty three all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you do ye even so unto them that is do by all mankind just as you would desire they should do by you if you were in their place and they in yours now to suit this rule to your particular circumstances suppose you were masters and mistresses and had servants under you would you not desire that your servants do their business faithfully and honestly as well when your back is turned as while you were looking over them would you not expect that they should take notice of what you said to them 
that they should behave themselves with respect towards you and yours and be as careful of everything belonging to you as you would be yourselves you are servants do therefore as you would wish to be done by and you will be both good servants to your masters and good servants to god who requires this of you and will reward you well for it if you do it for the sake of conscience in obedience to his commands the reverend teachers of such expositions of scripture do great injustice to the natural sense of their sable catechumens if they suppose them incapable of detecting such very shallow sophistry and of proving conclusively that it is poor rule that want work both ways some shrewd old patriarch of the stamp of those who rose up and went out at the exposition of the epistle of philemon and who show such great acuteness in bringing up objections against the truth of god such as would be thought peculiar to cultivated minds might perhaps if he dared reply to such an exposition of scripture in this way suppose you were a slave could not have a cent of your own earnings during your whole life could have no legal right to your wife and children could never send your children to school and had as you have told us nothing but labor and poverty in this life how would you like it would you not wish your christian master to set you free from this condition we submit to every one who is no respecter of persons whether this interpretation of sambo's is not as good as the bishop's and if not why not to us with our feelings and associations such discourses as these of bishop mead appear hard-hearted and unfeeling to the last degree we should however do great injustice to the character of the man if we suppose that they prove him to have been such they merely go to show how perfectly use may familiarize amiable and estimable men with a system of oppression till they shall have lost all consciousness of the wrong which it involves that bishop mead's reasonings did not thoroughly convince himself is evident from the fact that after all his representations of the superior advantages of slavery as a means of religious improvement he did at last emancipate his own slave but in addition to what has been said this whole system of religious instruction is darkened by one hideous shadow the slave trade what does the southern church do with her catechumens and communicants read the advertisements of southern newspapers and see in every city in the slave-raising states behold the depots kept constantly full of assorted negroes from the ages of ten to thirty in every slave-consuming state see the receiving houses whither these poor wrecks and remnants of families are constantly borne who preaches the gospel to the slave coffles who preaches the gospel to the slave prisons if we consider the tremendous extent of this internal trade if we read papers with columns of auction advertisements of human beings changing hands as freely as if they were dollar bills instead of human creatures we shall then realize how utterly all those influences of religious instruction must be nullified by leaving the subjects of them exposed to all the vicissitudes of property end of chapter nine is the system of religion which is taught the slave the gospel part four chapter ten of a key to uncle tom's cabin by harriet beecher stowe this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit us at librivox dot org recording by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana chapter ten what is to be done the thing to be done of which i shall chiefly speak is that the whole american church of all denominations should unitedly come up not in form but in fact to the noble purpose avowed by the presbyterian assembly of eighteen eighteen to seek the entire abolition of slavery throughout america and throughout christendom to this noble course the united voice of christians in all other countries is urgently calling the american church 
expressions of this feeling have come from christians of all denominations in england in scotland in ireland in france in switzerland in germany in persia in the sandwich islands and in china all seem to be animated by one spirit they have loved and honored this american church they have rejoiced in the brightness of her rising her prosperity and success have been to them as their own, and they have had hopes that God meant to confer inestimable blessings through her upon all nations. The American church has been to them like the rising of a glorious sun, shedding healing from his wings, dispersing mists and fogs, and bringing songs of birds and voices of cheerful industry, and sounds of gladness, contentment, and peace." But lo, in this beautiful orb is seen a disastrous spot of dim eclipse, whose gradually widening shadow threatens a total darkness. Can we wonder that the voice of remonstrance comes to us from those who have so much at stake in our prosperity and success? We have sent out our missionaries to all quarters of the globe, but how shall they tell their heathen converts the things that are done in Christianized America? How shall our missionaries in Mahometan countries hold up their heads and proclaim the superiority of our religion when we tolerate barbarities which they have repudiated? A missionary among the Karens in Asia writes back that his course is much embarrassed by a suspicion that is afloat among the Karens that the Americans intend to steal and sell them. He says, I dread the time when these Karens will be able to read our books and get a full knowledge of all that is going on in our country. Many of them are very inquisitive now and often ask me questions that I find it very difficult to answer. No, there is no resource. The Church of the United States is shut up in the providence of God to one work. She can never fulfill her mission till this is done. So long as she neglects this, it will lie in the way of everything else which she attempts to do. She must undertake it for another reason, because she alone can perform the work peaceably. If this fearful problem is left to take its course as a mere political question, to be ground out between the upper and nether millstones of political parties, then what will avert agitation, angry collisions, and the desperate rending of the Union? No, there is no safety but in making it a religious enterprise and pursuing it in a Christian spirit and by religious means. If it now be asked what means shall the church employ, we answer, this evil must be abolished by the same means which the apostles first used for the spread of Christianity, and the extermination of all the social evils which then filled the world lying in wickedness. Here the apostle enumerate them by pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. We will briefly consider each of these means. First, by pureness. Christians in the northern free states must endeavor to purify themselves and the country from various malignant results of the system of slavery, and in particular they must endeavor to abolish that which is the most sinful, the unchristian prejudice of caste. In Hindustan there is a class called the pariahs, with which no other class will associate, eat, or drink. Our missionaries tell the converted Hindu that this prejudice is unchristian, for God hath made of one blood all who dwell on the face of the earth, and all mankind are brethren in Christ. With what face shall they tell this to the Hindu, if he is able to reply? In your own Christian country there is a class of pariahs who are treated no better than we treat ours. You do not yourselves believe the things you teach us. Let us look at the treatment of the free Negro at the North. In the states of Indiana and Illinois, the most oppressive and unrighteous laws have been passed with regard to him. No law of any slave state could be more cruel in its spirit than that recently passed in Illinois, by which every free Negro coming into the state is taken up and sold for a certain time, and then, if he do not leave the state, is sold again. With what face can we exhort our southern brethren to emancipate their slaves, if we do not set the whole moral power of the church at the north against such abuses as this? Is this course justified by saying that the Negro is vicious and idle? This is adding insult to injury. What is it these Christian states do? 
to a great extent they exclude the colored population from their schools they discourage them from attending their churches by invidious distinctions as a general fact they exclude them from their shops where they might learn useful arts and trades they crowd them out of the better callings where they might earn an honorable livelihood and having thus discouraged every elevated aspiration and reduced them to almost inevitable ignorance idleness and vice they fill up the measure of iniquity by making cruel laws to expel them from their states thus heaping up wrath against the day of wrath if we say that every christian at the south who does not use his utmost influence against their iniquitive slave laws is guilty as a republican citizen of sustaining those laws it is no less true that every christian at the north who does not do what in him lies to procure the repeal of such laws in the free states is so far guilty for their existence of late years we have had abundant quotations from the old testament to justify all manner of oppression a hindu who knew nothing of this generous and beautiful book except from such pamphlets as mr smiley's might possibly think it was a treatise on piracy and a general justification of robbery but let us quote from it the directions which god gives for the treatment of the stranger if a stranger sojourn with you in your land ye shall not vex him but the stranger that dwelleth among you shall be as one born among you thou shalt love him as thyself how much more does this apply when the stranger has been brought into our land by the injustice and cruelty of our fathers we are happy to say however that the number of states in which such oppressive legislation exists is small it is also matter of encouragement and hope that the unphilosophical and unchristian prejudice of caste is materially giving way in many parts of our country before a kinder and more christian spirit many of our schools and colleges are willing to receive the colored applicant on equal terms with the white some of the northern free states accord to the colored free man full political equality and privileges some of the colored people under this encouragement have in many parts of our country become rich and intelligent a very fair proportion of educated men is rising among them there are among them respectable editors eloquent orators and laborious and well-instructed clergymen it gives us pleasure to say that among intelligent and christian people these men are treated with the consideration they deserve and if they meet with insult and ill-treatment it is commonly from the less educated class who being less enlightened are always longer under the influence of prejudice at a recent ordination at one of the largest and most respectable churches in new york the moderator of the presbytery was a black man who began life as a slave and it was undoubtedly a source of gratification to all his christian brethren to see him presiding in this capacity he put the questions to the candidate in the german language the church being in part composed of germans our christian friends in europe may at least infer from this that if we have had our faults in times past we have some of us seen and are endeavoring to correct them to bring this head at once to a practical conclusion the writer will say to every individual christian who wishes to do something for the abolition of slavery begin by doing what lies in your power for the colored people in your vicinity are their children excluded from schools by unchristian prejudice seek to combat that prejudice by fair arguments presented in a right spirit if you cannot succeed then endeavor to provide for the education of these children in some other manner as far as in you lies endeavor to secure for them in every walk of life the ordinary privileges of american citizens if they are excluded from the omnibus and railroad car in the place where you reside endeavor to persuade those who have the control of these matters to pursue a more just and reasonable course those christians who are heads of mechanical establishments can do much for the cause by receiving colored apprentices many masters excuse themselves for excluding the colored apprentice by saying that if they receive him all their other hands will desert them to this it is replied that if they do the thing in a christian temper and for a christian purpose the probability is that if their hands desert at first they will return to them at last all of them at least whom they would care to retain 
a respectable dressmaker in one of our towns has as a matter of principle taken colored girls for apprentices thus furnishing them with a respectable means of livelihood christian mechanics in all the walks of life are earnestly requested to consider this subject and see if by offering their hand to raise this poor people to respectability and knowledge and competence they may not be performing a service which the lord will accept as done unto himself another thing which is earnestly commended to christians is the raising and comforting of those poor churches of colored people who have been discouraged dismembered and disheartened by the operation of the fugitive slave law in the city of boston is a church which even now is struggling with debt and embarrassment caused by being obliged to buy its own deacons to shield them from the terrors of that law lastly christians at the north we need not say should abstain from all trading in slaves whether direct or indirect whether by partnership with southern houses or by receiving immortal beings as security for debt it is not necessary to expand this point it speaks for itself by all these means the christian church at the north must secure for itself purity from all complicity with the sin of slavery and from the unchristian customs and prejudices which have resulted from it the second means to be used for the abolition of slavery is knowledge every christian ought thoroughly carefully and prayerfully to examine this system of slavery he should regard it as one upon which he is bound to have right views and right opinions and to exert a right influence in forming and concentrating a powerful public sentiment of all others the most efficacious remedy many people are deterred from examining the statistics on this subject because they do not like the men who have collected them they say they do not like abolitionists and therefore they will not attend to those facts and figures which they have accumulated this certainly is not wise or reasonable in all other subjects which deeply affect our interests we think it best to take information where we can get it whether we like the persons who give it to us or not every christian ought seriously to examine the extent to which our national government is pledged and used for the support of slavery he should thoroughly look into the statistics of slavery in the district of columbia and above all into the statistics of that awful system of legalized piracy and oppression by which hundreds and thousands are yearly torn from home and friends and all that heart holds dear and carried to be sold like beasts in the markets of the south the smoke from this bottomless abyss of injustice puts out the light of our sabbath suns in the eyes of all nations its awful groans and wailings drown the voice of our songs and religious melodies all nations know these things of us and shall we not know them of ourselves shall we not have courage shall we not have patience to investigate thoroughly our own bad case and gain a perfect knowledge of the length and breadth of the evil we seek to remedy the third means for the abolition of slavery is long-suffering of this quality there has been some lack in the attempts that have hitherto been made the friends of the cause have not had patience with each other and have not been able to treat each other's opinions with forbearance there have been many painful things in the past history of this subject but is it not time when all the friends of the slave should adopt the motto forgetting the things that are behind and reaching forth unto those which are before let not the believers of immediate abolition call those who believe in gradual emancipation time-servers and traitors and let not the upholders of gradual emancipation call the advocates of immediate abolition fanatics and incendiaries surely some more brotherly way of convincing good men can be found than by standing afar off on some ebal or jurism and cursing each other the truth spoken in love will always go further than the truth spoken in wrath and after all the great object is to persuade our southern brethren to admit the idea of any emancipation at all when we have succeeded in persuading them that anything is necessary to be done then will be the time for bringing up the question whether the object shall be accomplished by an immediate or a gradual process meanwhile let our motto be 
whereto we have already attained let us walk by the same rule let us mind the same things and if any man be otherwise minded god shall reveal even this unto him let us receive even him that is weak in the faith but not to doubtful disputations let us not reject the good there is in any because of some remaining defects we come now to the consideration of a power without which all others must fail the holy ghost the solemn creed of every christian church whether roman greek episcopal or protestant says i believe in the holy ghost but how often do christians in all these denominations live and act and even conduct their religious affairs as if they had never so much as heard whether there be any holy ghost if we trust to our own reasonings our own misguided passions and our own blind self-will to effect the reform of abuses we shall utterly fail there is a power silent convincing irresistible which moves over the dark and troubled heart of man as of old it moved over the dark and troubled waters of chaos bringing light out of darkness and order out of confusion is it not evident to every one who takes enlarged views of human society that a gentle but irresistible influence is pervading the human race prompting groanings and longings and dim aspirations for some coming era of good worldly men read the signs of the times and call this power the spirit of the age but should not the church acknowledge it as the spirit of god let it not be forgotten however that the gift of his most powerful regenerating influence at the opening of the christian dispensation was conditioned on prayer the mighty movement that began on the day of pentecost was preceded by united fervent persevering prayer a similar spirit of prayer must precede the coming of the divine spirit to effect a revolution so great as that at which we aim the most powerful instrumentality which god has delegated to man and around which cluster all his glorious promises is prayer all past prejudices and animosities on this subject must be laid aside and the whole church unite as one man in earnest fervent prayer have we forgotten the promise of the holy ghost have we forgotten that he was to abide with us for ever have we forgotten that it is he who is to convince the world of sin of righteousness and of judgment o oh, divine and holy comforter thou promise of thy father thou only powerful to enlighten convince and renew return we beseech thee and visit this vine and this vineyard of thy planting with thee nothing is impossible and what we in our weakness can scarcely conceive thou canst accomplish another means for the abolition of slavery is love unfeigned in all moral conflicts that party who can preserve through every degree of opposition and persecution a divine unprovocable spirit of love must finally conquer such are the immutable laws of the moral world anger wrath selfishness and jealousy have all a certain degree of vitality they often produce more show more noise and temporary results than love still all these passions have in themselves the seeds of weakness love and love only is immortal and when all the grosser passions of the soul have spent themselves by their own force love looks forth like the unchanging star with a light that never dies in undertaking this work we must love both the slaveholder and the slave we must never forget that both are our brethren we must expect to be misrepresented to be slandered and to be hated how can we attack so powerful an interest without it we must be satisfied simply with the pleasure of being true friends while we are treated as bitter enemies this holy controversy must be one of principle and not of sectional bitterness we must not suffer it to degenerate in our hands into a violent prejudice against the south and to this end we must keep continually before our minds the more amiable features and attractive qualities of those with whose principles we are obliged to conflict 
if they say all manner of evil against us we must reflect that we expose them to great temptation to do so when we assail institutions to which they are bound by a thousand ties of interest and early association and to whose evils habit has made them in a great degree insensible the apostle gives us this direction in cases where we are called upon to deal with offending brethren consider thyself lest thou also be tempted we may apply this to our own case and consider that if we had been exposed to the temptations which surround our friends at the south and received the same education we might have felt and thought and acted as they do but while we cherish all these considerations we must also remember that it is no love to the south to countenance and defend a pernicious system a system which is as injurious to the master as to the slave a system which turns fruitful fields to deserts a system ruinous to education to morals and to religion and social progress a system of which many of the most intelligent and valuable men at the south are weary and from which they desire to escape and by emigration are yearly escaping neither must we concede the rights of the slave for he is also our brother and there is a reason why we should speak for him which does not exist in the case of his master he is poor uneducated and ignorant and cannot speak for himself we must therefore with greater jealousy guard his rights whatever else we compromise we must not compromise the rights of the helpless nor the eternal principles of rectitude and morality we must never concede that it is an honorable thing to deprive working men of their wages though like many other abuses it is customary reputable and popular and though amiable men under the influence of old prejudices still continue to do it never not even for a moment should we admit the thought that an heir of god and a joint heir of jesus christ may lawfully be sold upon the auction block though it be a common custom we must repudiate with determined severity the blasphemous doctrine of property in human beings some have supposed it an absurd refinement to talk about separating principles and persons or to admit that he who upholds a bad system can be a good man all experience proves the contrary systems most unjust and despotic have been defended by men personally just and humane it is a melancholy consideration but no less true that there is almost no absurdity and no injustice that has not at some period of the world's history had the advantage of some good man's virtues in its support it is a part of our trial in this imperfect life were evil systems only supported by the evil our moral discipline would be much less severe than it is and our course in attacking error far plainer on the whole we cannot but think that there was much christian wisdom in the remark which we have before quoted of the poor old slave women whose whole life had been darkened by this system that we must hate the sin but love the sinner the last means for the abolition of slavery is the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left by this we mean an earnest application of all straightforward honorable and just measures for the removal of the system of slavery every man in his place should remonstrate against it all its sophistical arguments should be answered its biblical defenses unmasked by correct reasoning and interpretation every mother should teach the evil of it to her children every clergyman should fully and continually warn his church against any complicity with such a sin it is said that this would be introducing politics into the pulpit it is answered that since people will have to give an account of their political actions in the day of judgment it seems proper that the minister should instruct them somewhat as to their political responsibilities in that day christ will ask no man whether he was of this or that party but he certainly will ask him whether he gave his vote in fear of god and for the advancement of the kingdom of righteousness it is often objected that slavery is a distant sin with which we have nothing to do if any clergyman wishes to test this fact let him once plainly and faithfully preach upon it he will probably then find that the roots of the poison tree have run under the very hearthstone of new england families and that in his very congregation are those in complicity with this sin 
it is no child's play to attack an institution which has absorbed into itself so much of the political power and wealth of this nation and they who try it will soon find that they wrestle not with flesh and blood no armor will do for this warfare but the armor of righteousness to our brethren in the south god has pointed out a more arduous conflict the very heart shrinks to think what the faithful christian must endure who assails this institution on its own ground but it must be done how was it at the north there was a universal effort to put down the discussion of it here by mob law printing presses were broken houses torn down property destroyed brave men however stood firm martyr blood was shed for the right of free opinions and speech and so the right of discussion was established nobody tries that sort of argument now its day is past in kentucky also they tried to stop the discussion by similar means mob violence destroyed a printing press and threatened the lives of individuals but there were brave men there who feared not violence or threats of death and emancipation is now open for discussion in kentucky the fact is the south must discuss the matter of slavery she cannot shut it out unless she lays an embargo on the literature of the whole civilized world if it be indeed divine and god appointed why does she so tremble to have it touched if it be of god all the free inquiry in the world cannot overthrow it discussion must and will come it only requires courageous men to lead the way brethren in the south there are many of you who are truly convinced that slavery is a sin a tremendous wrong but if you confess your sentiments and endeavor to propagate your opinions you think that persecution affliction and even death await you how can we ask you then to come forward we do not ask it ourselves weak irresolute and worldly shall we ask you to do what perhaps we ourselves should not dare but we will beseech him to speak to you who dared and endured more than this for your sake and who can strengthen you to dare and endure for his he can raise you above all temporary and worldly considerations he can inspire you to that love to himself which will make you willing to leave father and mother and wife and child yea to give up life itself for his sake and if he ever brings you to that place where you and this world take a final farewell of each other where you make up your mind solemnly to give all up for his cause where neither life nor death nor things present nor things to come can move you from this purpose then will you know a joy which is above all other joy a peace constant and unchanging as the eternal god from whom it springs dear brethren is this system to go on for ever in your land can you think these slave laws anything but an abomination to a just god can you think this internal slave trade to be anything but an abomination in his sight look we beseech you into those awful slave prisons which are in your cities do the groans and prayers which go up from those dreary mansions promise well for the prosperity of your country look we beseech you at the mournful march of the slave coffles follow the bloody course of the slave ships on your coast what suppose you does the lamb of god think of all these things he whose heart was so tender that he wept at the grave of lazarus over a sorrow that he was so soon to turn into joy what does he think of this constant heart-breaking yearly repeated anguish what does he think of christian wives forced from their husbands and husbands from their wives what does he think of christian daughters whom his church first educates indoctrinates and baptizes and then leaves to be sold as merchandise think you such prayers as poor paul edmondson's such deathbed scenes as emily russell's are witnessed without emotion by that generous saviour who regards what is done to his meanest servant as done to himself did it never seem to you o christian when you have read the sufferings of jesus that you would gladly have suffered with him does it never seem almost ungenerous to accept eternal life as the price of such anguish on his part while you bear no cross for him have you ever wished you could have watched with him in that bitter conflict at gethsemane when even his chosen slept have you ever wished that you could have stood by him when all forsook him and fled 
that you could have owned when peter denied that you could have honored him when buffeted and spit upon would you think it too much honor could you like mary have followed him to the cross and stood a patient sharer of that despised unpitied agony that you cannot do that hour is over christ now is exalted crowned glorified all men speak well of him rich churches rise to him and costly sacrifice goes up to him what chance have you among the multitude to prove your love to show that you would stand by him discrowned dishonored tempted betrayed and suffering can you show it in any way but by espousing the cause of his suffering poor is there a people among you despised and rejected of men heavy with oppression acquainted with grief with all the power of wealth and fashion of political and worldly influence arrayed against their cause christian you can acknowledge christ in them if you turn away indifferent from this cause if thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that be ready to be slain if thou sayest behold we knew it not doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it and he that keepeth the soul doth he not know it shall he not render to every man according to his works in the last judgment will he not say to you i have been in the slave prison in the slave coffle i have been sold in your markets i have toiled for naught in your fields i have been smitten on the mouth in your courts of justice i have been denied a hearing in my own church and ye cared not for it ye went one to his farm and another to his merchandise and if ye shall answer when lord he shall say unto you inasmuch as ye have done it to the least of these my brethren ye have done it unto me this ends part four chapter ten what is to be done Appendix of A Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by William Jones. Appendix Facts versus Figures or the nine arab brothers being a new arabian nights entertainment it is a favorite maxim that figures cannot lie we are loath to assail the time-honored reputation for veracity of this ancient and most respectable race there may have been days of pastoral innocence and primitive simplicity when they did not lie when abraham said contemplatively in his tent door with nothing to do all the long day but compose psalms and pious meditations it is likely that he had implicit faith in this maxim and never thought of questioning the statistical tables of eliezer of damascus with regard to the number of camels asses sheep oxen and goats which illustrated the prairie for he was for the time being encamped. Alas for those good old days! Figures did not lie then, we freely admit, but we are sadly afraid, from their behavior in recent ages, that this arose from no native innocence of disposition, but simply from want of occasion and opportunity. In those days they were young and green, and had not learned what they could do. The first inventor who commenced making a numeration table with the artless primeval machine of his toes and fingers had, like other great inventors, very little idea of what he was doing and what would be the mighty uses of these very simple characters when men got to having republican governments and elections and discussions of all sorts of unheard-of questions in politics and morals and to electioneering among these poor simple arab herdsmen the nine digits for their votes on all these complicated subjects no wonder that the figures have had their heads turned such unprecedented power and popularity is enough to turn any head 
we are sorry to speak ill of them but really we must say that like many of our political men they have been found on all sides of every subject to an extent that is really very confusing of course there is no doubt of their veracity somewhere the only problem being on which side and where is any great measure to be carried nowadays of course these statistics cut and dried in regular columns on both sides of the question contradict each other point blank as to opposite cannons and each party marshals behind them firing them off with infinite alacrity but with no particular effect except the bewilderment of the few old-fashioned people who like mr pickwick at the review stand on the middle ground if that most respectable female person mrs partington who like most unsophisticated old ladies is a most vehement and uncompromising abolitionist could only hear these statistics that are to be shown up in favor of slavery she would take off her spectacles and wipe her eyes in pious joy and think that the millennium and nothing less had come upon earth such statistics they are about the woe and want and agony and heathenish darkness of africa which by that eminent foreign missionary operation the slave trade have been turned into light and joy and thanksgiving here she has them in round figures she only needs to put on her spectacles and look here ma'am you have it says the illustrator look on this side of the column here are three hundred million heathen don't spare the figures down in africa sunk in heathenism never heard the sound of the gospel actually eating each other alive now turn to this side of the column and here they all are over in america clothed and in their right mind going to church with their masters and finding the hymns in their own hymn books now ma'am can you doubt the beneficial results of the slave trade but mrs partington has heard something about the middle passage which she thought was horrid <gasps> by no means dear madam says the illustrator whisking over his papers i have that all in figures average of deaths in the first cargoes twenty five per cent large average certainly they didn't manage the business exactly right but then the rate of increase in a christian country averages twenty five per cent over what it would have been in africa now mrs partington if these had been left in africa they would have been all heathen by getting them over here you have just as many and all christians to boot because you see the excess of increase balances the percentage of loss and we make no deduction for interest in those cases now as mrs partington did not know with very great clearness what percentage and average mean and as mental philosophers have demonstrated that we are always powerfully affected by the unknown she is all the more impressed with this reasoning on that account being one of the simple old-fashioned people who have not yet gotten over the impression that figures cannot lie well now really she says strange what these figures will do i always thought the slave trade was monstrous wicked but it really seems to be quite a missionary work the fact is that these nomadic arabs the digits are making a very unfair use among us of the family reputation gotten up during the palmy days of their innocence when they were a breezy contemplatively unsophisticated race of shepherds and to use an american elegance of expression had not yet cut their eye teeth all that remains of the oriental origin in this country seems to be a characteristic turn for romancing not an addition of slave territory has been made to the united states wherein these same arab brothers have not with grave faces been brought in as witnesses to swear by the honor of the family 
that it was absolutely essential for the best interest of the African race that there should be more slavery and more slave territory. To be sure, it was for the pecuniary gain of the American race, but that was not the point insisted on. Oh, no, we are always very glad when our interest coincides with that of the African race, but the extension of slavery is not to be considered in that light principally. It is entirely a system of Christian education and evangelization of one race by another. Left to himself, Quashi goes right back to heathenism. His very body deteriorates. He becomes idiotic, insane, deaf, dumb, blind. Everything that can be thought of. Is this an actual fact? asks some incredulous congressman, as innocent as Mrs. Partington. Oh, yeah, for only look, here are the statistics. Just see, here in the town of Kittery in Maine are 27 insane and idiotic black people, and down there in the town of Dittery, South Carolina, not a single one. Some simple-minded Kittery man, who overhears this conversation in the lobby, perhaps opens his eyes and reflects with wonder that he never knew that there were so many black people in town. But the congressman shows it to him in the census, and he concludes to look for them when he goes home, as figures cannot lie. On the census of 1840, conclusions innumerable as to the capacity of the colored race to subsist in freedom have been based. It has been the very beetle, sledgehammer, and broad axe when all other means fail. The objector, with a triumphant flourish, exclaims, There, sir, what do you think of the census of 1840? You see, sir, the thing's been tried, and it's no go. We poor common folks cannot tell what to think. Some of us suppose that we know that there were more insane and idiotic, variously dilapidated Negroes reported in certain states than their entire Negro population. But, of course, as it's down in the census, and as figures never lie, we must believe our own eyes. We can only say what some people have thought. That most inconvenient and pertinacious man, John Quincy Adams, made a good deal of trouble in Congress about this same matter. At no less than five different times did this very persistent old gentleman rise in Congress with the statement that the returns of the census had been notoriously and grossly falsified in this respect, and that he was prepared, if leave were given, to present before the House the most complete, direct, and overwhelming evidence to this effect. The following is an account of Mr. Adams' endeavors on this subject, collected from the Congressional Globe and Niles Register. 28th Congress of the United States House of Representatives, February 26, 1844 Mr. Adams, on leave, offered the following resolution. Resolved that the Secretary of State be directed to inform this House whether any gross errors have been discovered in the sixth census or enumeration of the inhabitants of the United States, as corrected by the Department of State in 1841, and, if so, how these errors originated, what they are, and what, if any, measures have been taken to rectify them. House of Representatives, May 6th, 1844. The journal having been read, Mr. Adams moved a correction of the same by striking out from the communication of the Secretary of State in answer to a resolution of this House inquiring whether any gross errors had been discovered in the printing of the sixth census, as copying upon the journal the following words, that no such errors had been discovered. Mr. Adams accompanied his motion with some remarks. It could not possibly, Mr. Adams said, be a correct representation, as very gross errors had been discovered 
as he intended and would pledge himself to show. He said they referred to the number of insane, blind, and so forth among the colored population. This had been made the subject of a pamphlet on the annexation of Texas, and of a speech by a gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Hammett, which had been refuted on this floor. The United States were at this time placed in a condition very little short of war with Great Britain, as well as Mexico, on the foundation of these very errors. It was important, therefore, that the true state of facts should be made to appear. The speaker remarked that whether errors existed or not would be a matter of investigation. In the opinion of the chair, there was no error of the journal, because it contained only a faithful transcript of the communication made by the Secretary of State. Mr. Adams persisted in his motion. It was, he said, the most extraordinary communication ever made from the State Department. He would pledge himself to produce documents to prove that gross errors did exist. He would produce such proof as no man would be able to contradict. The House refused to amend the journal. House of Representatives, May 16, 1844. Mr. Adams wished to present a memorial from certain citizens in relation to errors which they said have been committed in compiling and printing the last census of the United States. Objections being made, he moved to suspend the rules for the purpose of offering the resolution and moving to refer it to a committee of five members. The yeas and nays were ordered, and being taken, the rules were not suspended. Eyes 96, nays 49, less than two-thirds voting in the affirmative. House of Representatives, December 10, 1844. Mr. Adams presented a petition from the American Statistical Society in relation to certain errors in the last or sixth census. Mr. Adams said a petition on this subject at the last session was referred to a select committee, and he hoped this petition would take the same direction. He moved the appointment of a select committee of nine members, and that the memorial be printed. The speaker announced that a majority had decided in favor of a select committee. The motion to print was laid on the table. House of Representatives, December 13, 1844. The following is the select committee appointed on the motion of Mr. Adams to consider the petition from the American Statistical Society in relation to the errors in the sixth census. Messrs. Adams, Rhett, Rayner, Stiles, McClay, Bringle, Foster, Shepard, Carey, and Caleb B. Smith. This was the end of the affair in Congress. The false returns stand to this day in the statistical tables of the census. To convince all cavillers of the unfitness of the Negro for freedom, that the reader may know what kind of evidence Mr. Adams had, with which to sustain his allegations, we append as a specimen an extract from the American Almanac for 1845, page 156. The American Statistical Association, established in Boston, Massachusetts, sent a memorial to Congress during the past winter, drawn up by Messrs. William Brigham, Edward Jarvis, and J. W. Thornton, in which, though they confined their investigation to the reports respecting education and nosology, they exposed an extraordinary mass of errors in the census. We can find room for only a few extracts from this memorial. The most glaring and remarkable errors are found in the statements respecting nosology, the prevalence of insanity, blindness, deafness, and dumbness, among the people of this nation. The undersigned have compared these statements with information obtained from other more reliable sources, and have found them widely varying from the truth. And, more than all, they have compared the statements in one part of the census with those in another part, and have found most extraordinary discrepancies. 
they have also examined the original manuscript copy of the census deposited by the marshal of the district of massachusetts in the clerk's office in boston and have compared this with the printed edition of both blair and rives and thomas allen and found here too a variance of statement your memorialists are aware that some of these errors in respect to massachusetts and perhaps also in respect to other states were committed by the marshals mr william h williams deputy marshal states that there were one hundred and thirty three colored pauper lunatics in the family of samuel b woodward in the town of worcester but on another page he states that there are no colored persons in said Woodward's family. Mr. Benali Blood, deputy marshal, states on one page that there were fourteen colored pauper lunatics and two colored lunatics who were supported at private charge in the family of Charles E. Parker in the town of Pepperell, while on another page he states that there are no colored persons in the family of said Parker mr william m paxson states on one page that there are in the family of jacob cushman in the town of plimpton four pauper colored lunatics and one colored blind person while on another page he states that there are no colored persons in the family of said cushman but on comparing the manuscript copy of the census at boston with the printed edition of blair and rives the undersigned are convinced that a large portion of the errors were made by the printers and that hardly any of the errors of the original document are left out the original document finds the colored insane in twenty-nine towns while the printed edition of blair and rives places them in thirty-five towns and each makes them more than tenfold greater than the state returns in regard to the paupers and one edition has given twenty and the other twenty-seven self-supporting lunatics in towns in which according to private inquiry none are to be found according to the original and manuscript copy of the census there were in massachusetts ten deaf and dumb and eight blind colored persons whereas the printed editions of the same document multiply them into seventeen of the former and twenty-two of the latter class of unfortunates the printed copy of the census declares that there were in the towns of hingham and situate nineteen colored persons who were deaf and dumb blind or insane on the other hand the undersigned are informed by the overseers of the poor and the assessors who have cognizance of every pauper and taxpayer in the town that in the last twelve years no such deceased persons have lived in the town of situate and they have equally certain proof that none such have lived in hingham moreover the deputy marshals neither found nor made record of such persons the undersigned have carefully compared the number of colored insane and idiots and of the deaf and dumb and blind with the whole number of the colored population as stated in the printed edition of the census in every city town and county of the united states and have found the extraordinary contradictions and improbabilities that are shown in the following tables the errors of the census are as certain if not as manifest in regard to the insanity among the whites as among the colored people wherever your memorialists have been able to compare the census with the results of the investigations of the state governments of individuals or societies they have found that the national enumeration has fallen far short of the more probable amount according to the census there were in massachusetts six hundred and twenty seven lunatics and idiots supported at public charge according to the returns of the overseers of the poor there were eight hundred and twenty seven of this class of paupers the superintendents of the poor of the state of new york report one thousand and fifty-eight pauper lunatics within the state the census reports only seven hundred and thirty-nine 
the government of New Jersey reports 701 in that state. The census discovers only 442. The Medical Society of Connecticut discovered twice as many lunatics as the census within that state. A similar discrepancy was found in eastern Pennsylvania and also in some counties in Virginia. Your memorialists deem it needless to go further into detail in this matter. Suffice it to say that these are but specimens of the errors that are to be found in the sixth census in regard to nosology and education, and they suspect also in regard to other matters therein reported. In view of these facts, the undersigned, in behalf of said association, conceive that such documents ought not to have the sanction of Congress, nor ought they to be regarded as containing true statements relative to the condition of the people and the resources of the United States. They believe it would have been far better to have had no census at all than such as one as has been published and they respectfully request your honorable body to take such order thereupon, and to adopt such measures for the correction of the same, or if the same cannot be corrected, for discarding and disowning the same, as the good of the country shall require, and as justice and humanity shall demand. We have room for the tables for only three of the states. We will caution the reader not to skip this statistical table, as he probably never saw one like it before. There is a table for Maine that lists towns in Maine, and then a column for the total number of colored inhabitants, and one for colored insane. The first column for the state of Maine has a total of only five such individuals, five colored inhabitants. The colored insane shows 37. So of a total of five colored inhabitants, 37 of them are insane. In New Hampshire, it's similar. The column for the total number of colored inhabitants amounts to two. The column of insane inhabitants is 14. In Massachusetts, similarly, there are 13 towns listed with a total of 160 total inhabitants of colored people, with 155 of them being counted as insane. Every fable, allegory, and romance must have its moral. The moral of this ought to be deeply considered by the American people. In order to gain capital for the extension of slave territory, the most important statistical document of the United States has been boldly, grossly, and perseveringly falsified, and stands falsified to this day. Query. If state documents are falsified in support of slavery, what confidence can be placed in any representations that are made upon the subject? End of Appendix Recording by William Jones this is also the end of a key to Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe.